welcome everybody to this council's ordinary council meeting of today's date, 28th of July. Welcome to those councillors, first of all, that are Zooming in. We have councillors Duncan, Ash, Panapa, Rokawa. Um, I have a, an apology that I'll deal with um, in a second from Councillor Hira, but in the meantime, can we go for council prayer? Deputy Mayor, Councillor Bertha Felton, would you mind please standing? Thank you. <coughs> Almighty God, as members of the Rangitike District Council, we give thanks for all the good things of our district and the advantages we enjoy. We pray that you will give us wisdom and guidance as we conduct the affairs of this meeting. We pray for all the communities and the district we represent. Help us to be fair and honest in our discussions and help us to work together in unity for the welfare of all your people. Amen. Thank you, <coughs> Councillor Belsham, and I want to thank you also for chairing the last council meeting, even though I was there, I was dealing with the, the hangover effects of flu, and so doing it remotely, so thank you very much for that. I have an apology from Councillor Hira, other than that I think everybody else is here, would somebody like to so move please? Thank you, Councillor Carter, Councillor Lambert, those in favour? Aye. 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 Carried, thank you. We don't have a public forum today, but I will advise you that we will be have a Zoom in from um, Hamish Lowe from Lowe Environmentals at 1.30, I believe. I'll remind councillors around the conflict of interest declarations any conflicts of interest, as you know it at the moment? Um, just Come. want to let you know that um, around the Kiwi Boon, my brother is the owner of the property that hosts Kiwi Boon. Thank you very much. We'll regard that as a conflict of interest. Confirmation of order of business is as stated. However, we will have low environmentals at one thirty. Looking for the confirmation of minutes, um, starting on my pages on hard copy on page six, looking for alterations, corrections, six and seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. Would somebody like to move then? Thank you. Move. Councillor Belsham moving, seconded by Councillor Carter. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Carried. Thank you very much. Move to item seven. This is the follow up action items from the previous meeting and in the order paper at 21. We're looking for any follow up actions you wish to discuss on items one through to 10 first. Anything there? Going then from 11 through to 19. <coughs> I would note that item number 11, the drafting of the submission on the Water Services Entities Bill um, was in and on time, um, and they're available on the Council website. Can I just comment. Um, I I understand it went on onto the onto the website on the twentieth of July, with submissions closing on the twenty second of July. I just like to express my disappointment that that didn't go on earlier. I would have thought uh, um, some member of the public may have found our submission helpful in making their own. Yes, and I and I do accept that. Um, we did have a little bit of a process, obviously, to go through to get to that stage ourselves following the council meeting, but <coughs> I, accept, I accept that as a criticism of, of myself. Any... Councillor Carter? Um, item 13. Yeah. Um, Ensco Manawa 2, Ensco Bulls. Ensco Rangitiki also has an address as Bulls. Okay, can, this, can we just can leave that with staff to seek a correction where needed? Thank you. Anything further on 11 through to 19? <coughs> uh, 
I note that I think it's item number yeah, 19 where it discusses um, safety concerns and enforcement practices in terms of bylaws and the power to enforce that came up as a remit at local government this morning, which was passed. Looking 20 through to 26. No. 27 to 33. Councillor, Councillor Gordon. Um, I have a question about item 21. Yeah. Um, so the Chief Executive. When would you expect some progress in this matter? This is re regarding the MOU with the Mangawika Historical Society. Is it, I mean, in this one, you comment you're awaiting advice from MDC. Um, is, is that going to be a long, drawn-out process, or is that relatively straightforward? Through you, Your Worship, it should be relatively straightforward. Uh, I have requested information from uh, from the writing team on the MDC side just to see where they are, mm -hmm. and also from Graham Poynton on our side. Uh, and from what I can gather, it is progressing. What they wanted was a maintenance program so that the society can understand what the responsibilities are. And I think that is expected by the end of July or early in August. Thank you. So can I just ask, in addition to that, who's the community person <coughs> that, that we're engaged with that fronts that group? I don't, I don't know. I'll ask John who they're dealing with. Uh, between the two, uh, I'm not sure. So we're focusing at the moment on our potential responsibilities and work program going forward in terms of maintenance. But we have to still form an MOU with an active community group. We have an MOU. Okay. Anything further? Would somebody like to so move the receipt of that? Councillor Lambert, Councillor Carter, those in favour to my aye. I carry, thank you. <coughs> we move now to the Mayor's report that I'm just looking at. Hopefully we can get through this before half past one. It is quite lengthy. I will take a lot of it as read. Um, you will note that there is a table additional document. And I do want to speak to two or three things with regard to this. And an additional, additional matter, we had the annual general meeting for Local Government New Zealand this morning online at 8.30. Um, of particular interest were the remits, and all of the remits we supported, the six remits we were in support of, all of them passed. The last one, item six, was probably the, the one with the lowest pass rate of 67%. We seconded remit number two, which is the support to New Plymouth Council to say um, they need to look at funding cycles for maintenance of roads, etc., well beyond the three year electoral cycle, calling for a review of um, funding for roading. But that's that one. Uh, fluoridation, I note that six local councils, six councils have been instructed to uh, fluoridate their water supply. <coughs> and there's two points that I'd like to point out from that. One is why only six? And my initial thought was they're looking to pick councils off one by one. Um, but it seems to be uh, um, Christchurch said they just can't afford to do it. It would be a major, major expense for them at the moment. And so presumably they will be Bought in later. This would bring 60% of the people in New Zealand having a fluoridated water supply. What it does indicate is it will become a national direction as part of the Three Waters program. We don't fluoridate, um, but you can bet your bottom dollar that our water supplies will be fluoridated in the near future. Um, conference, I have I'm certainly not going to read all the table document but there are a couple of other things <coughs> that came out of conference and i have included in the report this morning i received notification that there were people excluded from conference 
So the taxpayers' union, um, Jordan, wasn't allowed in, along with nine of their staff. Um, but what probably <coughs> concerns me more is that a sitting councillor from a city was excluded. And what I would suggest is that we ask the question of local government as to why. Bearing in mind that I'm dealing with a report that is second-hand in nature and press aren't always known for their accuracy. Um, and there may well be other reasons, but I think it is fair, and as part of my report, I'll move that we just ask the question of local government New Zealand as to why that happened. Unless anybody has a disagreement with that part of my report. There's a whole lot of my views on the principal addresses from local <coughs> government New Zealand, and if there are factual things wrong in the table document, I apologise, it was um, typed up at last moment this morning. Other than that, I, um, my Mayor's report, I'll seek a correction in the third paragraph down. This is the report that actually went out normal circumstances, where it says um, it discusses Mayor's task force for jobs and puts in a figure of $30,000 as being the budget from MSD. That figure is incorrect. I think it was $230,000 that they looked to drop it to. It has been um, increased to 450000 that we can apply for. Other than that, I'll take any questions around my mayoral engagements or anything that is in any, in any of those reports. I note also that councillors um, <coughs> Dalgetty, um, Duncan and Parnapa went to local government con uh, conference and at some stage I'm sure that they will have a different view of parts of my report when they need to do their report. Anything? Councillor Rokawa online, question, and then I'll go to Councillor Duncan. Councillor Rokawa, first. Uh, yes, thank you, um, Your Worship. It was about the um, Mayor's task force. So is the contractor, so the contract's rolled over, is the contractor still the same? Will it just... Is the whole contract just going to roll over and stay um, doing our collaboration with the iwi as well? Pretty much the same. Some of the conditions have been altered slightly around who will be the target audiences. I am speaking a little louder because the microphones are some distance away from my seat. So if you've been having trouble hearing, please I will speak louder or to flag it to me that you can't hear. Um, but essentially, we had $500,000 in the past, uh, $450,000 this time around, and, and they are still seeming to be incredibly flexible as to how we use that. So the relationships um, with Nawaraki Natiapa um, and Louise McCord will continue. Um, does that answer your question? Uh, and we still will be employing the contractor. Is that still the same? James, is it? James. Yeah, that becomes an operational contract um, through you. the chief executive. So I'm not sure that I'm in the position to um, speak on that one at the moment. Thank you. Sorry, it is a paper today, is it? I'm sorry to ask a question, Your Worship. But... Um, so it, it is on the agenda for today for um, resolution by, by council. Yeah, that is, Councillor Ricard, that's something that is a contractual position regardless and will always be discussed in committee. Go to Councillor Duncan next and then Councillor Ash. Councillor Duncan. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to say this is an incredible list of follow-up actions and um, it just shows how much work our staff are doing. I want to say thank you for that. Um, also, uh, I unfortunately am unable to open the Mayor's report on the conference, but would like to um, thank the Council and 
everyone involved for the ability to go again this year. It was um, it was a very it was very illuminating and I think uh, very helpful in, in my position. So thank you for that. And my report will be forthcoming. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to say. Uh, I just wondered if, if while we were doing follow-ups, um, I might seek some clarity around the um, the next steps with the squash club. Um, they do come to me and ask me what what's happening next. And uh, so if you could um, illuminate me on that, either in this meeting or subsequently, I'd be um, most appreciative. Executive Director, would you want to speak to it um, I could respond now, but um, uh, off the cuff, um, Your Worship, off the cuff, um, we I have advised them of Council's uh, resolution from the annual plan, uh, which we advised, um, sorry, staff <coughs> advised that uh, there was no impediment for Council to provide that additional land to the Squash Club. Uh, I don't recall a response from the Squash Club since, and there's been no correspondence, but I would anticipate uh, if the Squash Club want to discuss it, they will do so with, with my, me or my operations team. Uh, and as a first, uh, not, not excluding, of course, elected members, Your Worship, but um, it's uh, probably easier to come to me um, to, to, to get the wheels moving. Thank you. Thank you. I'll go to Councillor Ash, then Councillor Gordon, Councillor Ash. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, just wondering whether or not we need to um, request a, an action uh, coming from your uh, document that you sent through in regards to LGNZ um, banning uh, the Ratepayers Association. Were you going to uh, request a letter is sent from Council, in which case I'd certainly support that I had a number of people contact me about that that were quite um, uh, blown away that LGNZ would do that. So definitely a, a letter of, of why and requesting an explanation would be um, a good move, I believe. Um, now, the other thing is around this fluoridation. I've... Councillor, it's just before you deal with that, we'll go further. Sure. Um, because I've, I've brought it to the attention of councillors as part of my report with the suggestion that we should do so, in passing my, and accepting my report, it will be something that naturally flows on. So it will occur. Fantastic. Fantastic. And the second... Second thing is I've received five calls this morning in regards to fluoridation. Um, so obviously people are, are hearing about this. How, how much say can we have, can the community have in regards to this, in regards to understanding it? Um, and if the community said, actually, as a community, we don't want it, um, is that something that could be taken on board at um, all? It is out of our jurisdiction. It has become a health matter. So um, we don't have discretion to be able to say yes or no. It's literally a health direction from government. And they, they have the absolute authority. And I have spoken uh, fairly informally with some mayors this morning that are in that position that have received those, those letters. They can't challenge it. It's like... So what, what could be my... So what could be my advice to people? I mean, I'm, I'm surprised, five calls just this morning. So I'm dreading how many I'm going to be getting in the coming weeks. Um, what can be my advice to these people that are coming to me with, with their concerns? Um, I personally previously knew people that have moved to the district uh, because we weren't fluoridated. So um, obviously people feel quite strongly about it. Uh, if you could give us some advice as to what we can be uh, suggesting to okay. people that are concerned about this? Um, the, what you could do is speak to your Member of Parliament and express your um, displeasure or your concern around that matter. It's not like it's something that's a select committee that we can appear in front of. So we don't have a, an, an active um, political process to be able to appeal this. 
Um, we and, as a council, what about individual um, members of the community? Well, any individual can write to their MP and say that they are dissatisfied. And of course, ultimately, um, we have elections next year. But by that stage, it's done and dusted. And that's been the whole concern really with around three water legislation as well. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Lovely, thank you. Uh, Councillor Gordon. Uh, Your Worship, on page 27, it's the beginning of your written mayor's report, uh, four paragraph down, were you commenting on the $10 million that's effectively stripped out of our roading maintenance budgets. I wonder, um, would it be possible to actually highlight this possibly on a website and especially to our rural ratepayers because I, I think with this sort of money disappearing out of our budgets, we know what the implications are. There's going to be an awful lot of pushback out of ratepayers in the next three years over this, um, just the physicality of it. So I think we need to flag it. Totally agree. Totally agree, and I've put it in several news articles and paper articles uh, to date. And when we went out for annual plan discussions, um, spatial plan discussions, etc., when we were in rural communities, I brought it up as probably one of the leading items of concern for me. And I think I'm quoted as saying it's probably the biggest issue that's kept me kept me awake at night, other than three waters. Um, and in seconding New Plymouth's motion today, one of the things I pointed out was that the three waters discussion is because of um, an intergenerational lack of spending on water and wastewater infrastructure. So you have a hundred years of inconsequential action, if you like. And what we're seeing now is it probably not the start of but certainly an accelerated decline in our roading networks and both national state highways and our own. However, the minister at local government conference, no, it might've been the prime minister, signaled um, a look, re-look at roading maintenance. I'm just trying to think about who actually said it or how, where I've heard it from, but um, certainly it was, can you remember, Peter? Um, the the question, oh, sorry, the information I provided to you, Your Worship, was that um, when the Ministry for Transport undertake their, um, uh, their review for 2024, they have said explicitly that they will be um, working with councils on Wakaputahi maintenance funding. Yeah, so this is worth understand, taking a second to understand because people, first of all, blame our councils and then the next level of blame is the contractor, such as, you know, whether it's Downers or Higgins or whoever. Um, and then they blame Waka Kutahi. But ultimately, those budgets are set by the Crown and they have to work within the budgets that they have been given. So ultimately, we can go to Waka Kotahi, and I have talked to a group of mayors saying, should we go to Auckland and appear in front of their board um, and express our displeasure with, with maintenance funding for them to take it back to government? Thank you, Your Worship. I'll just say that this is called a government policy statement, GPS. Um, and so GPS 24 is something that will appear on our list for council to submit on uh, and it will come via, via elected members. There is a secondary part of this as well. Um, and that's the road classification of our roads. So we're going through that process as well. So it's not only the maintenance of our existing roads, but the possibility of some of the, our roads being declassified to a narrower road width and possibly even from seal to metal. Yeah, it's not a very rosy picture. <clears throat> Any further questions of me if my mail report Thank you. Uh, also, 
also moved. Could I have a second or two? Councillor Gordon, those in favour? Those against? Carried, thank you very much. And I, by the way, I should actually thank um, my PA, Karen. I'm not sure if she's <coughs> sitting listening in. A whole lot of the stuff I sort of dumped on her um, first thing this morning. I'm trying to, that's the time frames and pressures that the staff are under, as well as local members. I should just add, I would like to thank um, Council uh, uh, for enabling me to go to um, conference as well. And unfortunately, my PA didn't get her report done in time. <laughs> <laughs> It will be forthcoming. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Have we got Hamish online? Yes. So, Hamish, are you able to turn your camera on? Thank you. This is Hamish Lowe from Lowe Environmentals, and I'll pass over to Arno to do the introductions and um, the background to the presentation today. Thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, today we would like to make use of the opportunity uh, to introduce Low Environmental to Council and to Councillors. Uh, and also just to give you a bit of a description of how we are planning to manage and communicate the Martin to Bulls centralisation project going forward. So it's a, it's a project that will stretch over many years. Uh, communications to this point, I think, has been poor, and we can improve on that a lot. Also, we thought if we have a single uh, overarching organization looking at all the different strands, it's better to make sure that everything happens at the right time according to the right program, and that's where low environmental comes into the picture. So I'm going to ask Hamish to uh, present to Council what we have in mind and how we are proposing to manage this going forwards. So over to you, Hamish. Yeah, thank you, Henry. Um, thank you, Your Worship and Councillors. Um, yeah, I'd just like to take the opportunity just to quickly give you a bit of a summary as to the, the discussions to date, a bit of planning that's occurred in terms of developing and, and moving this project forward. I know it's been sitting on your radar for a, a good number of years. Um, what I'm going to run through is a, a bit of a slide presentation that sort of takes you on a journey of some of the thinking and um, also a bit of a, a plan of what we're looking at. But also at the end, there's a couple of questions there in terms of the, I suppose, councillors' involvement in helping guide the, the project team with some of the decisions that will need to be made on that journey. I'm going to, if I can, share a screen. Hopefully I will get the right screen. We've got it, thank you. Right, okay, so um, at any time, just through this uh, the discussion, if there's any questions, by all means, jump in and, and we can have a, a bit of a chat as we go. Okay, so um, as I said, a bit of the background here, this project's been sitting on the, on the radar for a while. Um, the, the purpose of this discussion, though, is to pretty much give you a, an update and seek a bit of guidance from council, particularly with regards to engagement. Um, I want to specifically refer to engagement with Tangata Whenua, um, the community, um, local farmers, um, but also engagement with councillors as a, probably as a, as a subgroup of, of the wider council, I'll, and I'll come back to that. Um, probably just stating the obvious and acknowledging the obvious, um, at the moment, the, the discharges from the, uh, the two treatment plants, uh, Martin into the Tūtanui, Bulls into the Rangitiki, um, the bigger picture plan is to try and reduce, if not eliminate, or get as much of that water out of those waterways as, as possible. And so the, the decision made some time ago by yourselves has been to put a pipe between the two communities and look at opportunities to get some of that discharge, if not all of it, to land. I mean, as Arno has uh, indicated and introduced, um, yeah, we've been uh, asked to help with this, this journey or this program. Um, by, by way of background, um, uh, myself, I've been uh, in this area for, you know, physically in this area for probably about the last 25 years. It's a messy boy, come from a, a farming background out the back of Macedon. Um, yeah, ag science, done a lot of soils, agronomy work, so fairly familiar with farms. Um, through Massey University, specialised in um, wastewater irrigation, 
particularly. So I've sort of hung in there and stuck with that for the last 25 years. Probably the last 15 years, it's been more involved with councils and larger industry, such as the AFCOs and the Fonterras, um, as well as a number of councils um, dealing with uh, wastewater application to land. Um, I think for, for various reasons, I've been involved in about 85 uh, small community or community projects for discharging to land in the lower North Island alone. So yeah, been there, done a, done a bit of it. So hopefully I can bring some of that experience and some of that, uh, that knowledge to this project and, and help the, uh, the wider team coordinate what's needed. Uh, hey, Mitch, I have a question for you um, that I think I know the answer to, but just for those listening in, so the discharge from Martin will be, um, it won't be raw sewage, it will still go through the treatment processes <coughs> that we have at Crofton, and whereas it would normally be discharged to the to Tainui, the discharge will be through this pipeline. Yeah, get, get correct, and I, I suppose um, let's see. That's the understanding or the, um, the the approach that's been taken at this stage, but I suppose what we're wanting to look at, and I'll, I'll get into a bit more detail in a, in a couple of slides, is that we really need to consider what's best for a project. Now, if part of being best for a project is to modify the Martin wastewater treatment plant, being at the moment effectively a couple of big ponds, if the best for project is to modify those ponds in some way, well then that would probably, you know, that would be an, a logical choice that might mean a reduction or an increase in the level of treatment currently at Martin. Thank, thank okay. you. And a question that I get asked routinely by people driving past the pipes going in the ground, um, do they have significant capacity for future growth of the town? The, um, I'm probably a little bit green on that, sort of having come into this project after a lot of that work has, has been done. But my understanding with the size of the pipe, you've, there's, there's a lot of capacity. There's, um, last count, there's 24 hours in a day, and it's a, a matter of keeping the pumps going for a bit longer. So, yeah, there, there is a lot of capacity there. Um, there's also the ability to add a bit more pressure. Um, so there, I, I, Arno is probably the best un, uh, to respond to that, but I'm pretty sure there is capacity for growth. <coughs> I can, Your Worship, yes, I can confirm. Good question. Uh, we did uh, take into consideration the growth that's ahead of us, and there's enough capacity to deal with it. Thank you. I know that I'm asking a couple of patsy questions here, but it's right. easier to ask them now while people are on online. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Your Worship. So I just want to take a, a moment now just to talk a little bit about the, the structure, and I suppose the, the structure that um, I'm going to refer to as a... Um, it's a structure that I've used on a several um, similar and a couple of larger projects recently where we, what we want to do is coordinate the works that's needed in a, in a logical, systematic way rather than approaching things in a, in a, in a piecemeal um, way. So what we've done is effectively divide the project up into a series of phases. So the, the phases, the, the two key things for, for me in any project, um, regardless of its size, is, is good project management. You need to be able to make sure that you've got the structures in place so that when you get through the project, you have continuity, um, you have uh, good decision making and you have the right people involved. The second part of that, so we'll call phase A, is around engagement. Now, engagement is an enduring process that goes for the length of the project and arguably extends right the way through, in this case, to the operation of what is delivered. So that engagement I want to spend some time on and come back to. So the, if, if we actually start looking at the nuts and bolts and what we're actually doing rather than the, the talking about what we're doing, the first part is actually understanding what we've got. So it's around data gathering. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done to date. We need to understand that work. We don't want to be wasting council money by repeating work that's already been done. So we're going to pull together good information. From that information, we could then start looking at options. How do we best generate these options based on what we know and the information that we have? We then look at getting into consenting phase. So that's getting our, our necessary approval from the, our, our friends at the regional council and potentially yourselves in, in terms of uh, district council. Then into the design phase, uh, get on and build it, make it work. And then the, finally, the, there's the operational phase. But with, with where we are at the moment, one of the keys that we really need to, uh, um, to, to manage is around engagement. A lot of projects fall over or run into uh, headwinds because of opposition. And some cases, a number of cases, that, op that opposition is, is misinformed. 
And so what we'd like to do here is make sure that there's a really clear communication structure so that people understand and ideally buy into the process. Now, buying into the process doesn't necessarily mean to say everybody agrees, but at least they understand the rationale for the decisions that have been made. And we really want to make sure that there's a, a logical process with that. So engaging with Tangata Whenua community and um, the, 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 the regional council, keeping them involved is important as well. I, I, I haven't got a haven't got a slide of this, but one of the, the, the pieces of logic that I, I use or have used for projects like this is, is actually to split them into two parts. The first part, the front end, is around developing what is best for community. So looking at what is a sustainable, long-term, economically viable solution for a community, whether it be wastewater or water supply. That then elements of that decision or, or what we're proposing will then need resource consent then you go and get the necessary resource consent. I think, unfortunately, what happens with a lot of particularly wastewater projects is because it's quite emotive in terms of talking about um, you know, poos and wheeze, um, two time mimi, we, we get wound up and, 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 and the community get quite concerned about the emotive from a, a cultural aspect and an environmental aspect. What we want to be able to do is, is make good decisions upfront and then consent it. And so, effectively using an LGA process in terms of engagement. Yes, this is good for community. And then secondary resource consent. What quite often happens is you end up with a tail wagging the dog and you have regional council or regional council processes often actually dictating how the system should run, which I think is, is back to front. The, the key out of this engagement of, of what we want to achieve is, is coming up with what we refer to as a best practical option. Now, best practicable option, very clear in terms of the Resource Management Act of what it means, but I think it actually features much earlier in terms of we need to come up with what is best for the community. So that's a, a bit of background in terms of how we want to structure the program and, and how we're going to work through it. So pause there if there's any questions. A question from Councillor Gordon. Yes, good afternoon, Hamish. Look, I, I picked up on your comment about um, educating the groups and bringing them with you. My question is, how do you educate groups that have no technical knowledge or capacity and, and in some instances don't want to know? Um, and how, how do you stop them becoming the headwind that drives processes off on tangents that they end up you know, making the process rather unworkable? Because uh, yeah. some of the people out there in our greater audience who are ratepayers you know, don't know what they don't know and they don't want to know either because they're so emotive about issues like sewerage and water and rivers, et cetera. Yep. I, I think, um, yeah, you're, you're exactly right. I, I, I guarantee um, every project's got those, those naysayers. The, the, the challenge is how do we work with them to ideally um, take on board their views? Um, you know, sometimes they have some really good opinion, good views. Sometimes they'll have views that uh, have some merit, but we disagree with. I think we need to be able to work with them. And, and there's a little bit of a process that we've got tucked in here in terms of a community engagement group and how you structure and, and work through that. And I, I, I want to get to that a little bit later in, in, in this discussion, but I think that's a key element of it. And um, you need to be able to take people with you if you can. And it comes back to if you can, there will be some times when you just have to say, sorry, we have to move on for a whole range of reasons. And there will be some grief that, as a result of that. But um, yeah, we don't want to brainwash people, but we want to make sure they're well informed so they understand the reasons for the decisions. Um, Hamish, when you said LGA, you're referring to the Local Government Acts? Correct, yes. Yeah. So I, I suppose my, my, my thinking and logic on that is that within the Local Government Act, there's a, there's a process around obligations that a TA, a territorial authority, authority has to its community to provide sanitary wastewater services. So under the Health Act, councils are obliged to provide that facility. And so irrespective of the consenting of it, there's a, a primary obligation for the council to deliver on that is then the decision of that council is how they're going to do that. And the answer to that is then required to be have a appropriate resource consents. Thank you, Councillor Belsham. Thank you, uh, Your Worship, and thank you, Hamish. Just a question along a similar vein to Councillor Gordon's where 
<clears throat> probably the end game of this project is going to be the land disposal. And you will have the NIMBYs. Um, how do you deal with that? Are there clear examples of, of these disposal to land that, that can be shown to neighbours, potential neighbours, if, if that's the area where it's going to be disposed to? And how do you identify them and get them on board early? Yeah, okay, so um, probably two parts to that question. Are there other examples? Um, we could probably jump in a car and go for a drive and within two hours, I could probably take you to close on 20, if not 30 community land application systems. So there are examples out there. Some are really good and they, they, um, they're awesome. They're very productive farm systems. Um, some are not faring so well and are um, operating below ideal. So there's a, there's a, and there's a, that's a discussion all on its own. Um, coming back to the dealing with NIMBYs, um, NIMBYs not in my backyard for those who are not familiar with the, the acronym. Um, the, the best way to deal with NIMBYs is to actually show them and get them to understand. I think a lot of cases NIMBYism comes from a fear of the unknown. If you can get across that line with them, you then you, you can make progress and, and basically they once they go away but they become accepting however there will be some that, that will maintain hey we're not happy with this so there are various solutions to deal with it the most obvious obvious one is to go and buy their property so they go away but there's a there's a whole range of um, lesser extremes in, in, in the mix there um, and large comes back to education you know what we're dealing with here is not unique it's not new most countries around the world do it, and I think people just need to accept that um, it's part of how our community has to operate. Thank you. So th this is a very dangerous slide for me to put up, and um, anyone that's uh, familiar with setting timelines will probably uh, say sh you shouldn't have put that one up. Um, but uh, essentially, of um, on the... Um, the left hand side of the screen we've got the different phases so from you know, starting from engagement all the way through to getting things up and running you know, we've got a, a series of three years we, we really need to get some traction and make things happen um, effectively what I'm suggesting is that the first year is actually working out what we need to do and um, getting a large way through if, or as far as practically possible through the resource consenting process then we get into design and building and when we get into the 20, uh, 24, 25 year, that's when you can start pressing the big green button and make things happen. Um, however, I think we probably just need to caution this in that when we come to push that big green button, it may not be one thing, there may be a series of buttons. And I think the example that we've got at the moment is we've got a pipeline in the ground. So that's part way, we're part way there. There's gonna be other, a number of other little bits that on their own, they get the, the process a little bit further or the, the, the ultimate solution a little bit further. So there will be some very quick, easy wins on the way. Um, some of those will require basic design. Some may not require resource consent. And I think when we come to looking at the, the resource consent price process, if we're thinking about putting it to land, um, there may be a series of a number of pieces of land and they may require multiple consents over a period of time. And we might get into it and get the first chunk of land sorted and that's good enough from, from a growth perspective for the next five, maybe 10 years. But we know that in five to 10 years time, there needs to be some additional land. So the snapshot of time here is the reasonable anticipation to get the majority of the water um, as far as possible out of the river and onto land. Okay, Spaghetti Junction. Um, I think uh, this is a hell of a messy slide and I don't expect you to, to read it, but the, the, the point of, of putting it up is that across the top here, we've got a number of components that are typical of a waste management system. The first one is reticulation where you need to obviously reticulate it from the houses to a treatment plant. At a treatment plant, there are a number of different things you do at that treatment plant. Then you need to reticulate it, potentially need to store it, and then you ultimately need to discharge it. And as we go down through each of these boxes, there are multiple options. And what we need to be able to do is go through a process of connecting the dots. And you know, we might take uh, reticulation one, treatment B, uh, secondary reticulation A, and so forth. What we do have though, is in the middle, 
you've actually got a really good stake in the ground in terms of reticulation. And in, in my view, councils made a really good decision with a pipe between the two communities. Um, there's a, some, some great options that you have with this piece of pipe. And I think it shows that you can actually get on and do things. Um, and while you haven't got the big picture sorted, you can actually make that commitment. And I think using the DIA money, was a, you know, it's a good move to get that pipe in the ground. What we need to do now is we need to just confirm what we're doing with the treatment and ultimately what we're doing with the discharge, bearing in mind that what is required for treatment may be informed by where and how it's discharged. Okay, so how are we going to pull this together? Um, so pulling something like this together is not one person waving their arms around and, and, and pointing and shouting. Um, it's, a, it's a very much a team approach. And so what we've, um, what we've done is we've created a, a structure where there's a, a number of different people and, and groups feed into the mix. So um, excuse the, the, the clutter, but I'm just going to go through a, bit of a series of slides here that sort of show how things uh, piece together. Um, what we've got at the core of this is a project management team, which is um, myself, um, 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 Claire, part of the PMO, um, and a couple of people within in my team helping just on a day-to-day -day basis coordinate what's happening. Sitting outside that shell is what we've got our project control group that involves um, from a, the communications team, EWI representation, and Arno sitting in there. This core group of people, we're basically in touch weekly um, in terms of the control group. We're setting up a, a monthly catch up of how we, we bring everything together, we report, we track, and we, we, we set direction. Advising that group, you know, we, we, we don't have the answers, so we need to rely on a technical team. Um, that technical team in, involves a whole lot of other advisors, you know, wastewater treatment plant advisors, uh, soil scientists, freshwater ecologists, and so forth. So they, they contribute to the, the ideas and are, are managed by that uh, project management team. Sitting alongside that, though, is where we start to bring in um, information um, external from third parties. And there's a series of groups that I just want to run through the, those groups and the logic behind them. The first one is from a Tangata Whenua perspective. Um, as, as some of you may know, we, we had a meeting with, with TRAC. Um, it would have been about a month ago. Um, I think it was a, seemed to be a reasonably positive discussion. Um, some you know, eyes were lit up, and I think there was a bit of a fire in the belly of some say we can make a difference here, which is really positive. What, we ha uh, what has come out of that discussion is the nomination of a, a couple representatives from TRAC to be part of an iwi engagement team to actually help give us some guidance as a project management team as to iwi's understanding and take on and what should happen or what things could look like. Um, there's a lot of detail that could go into this discussion. Um, what we have done with this group and others is uh, we're reforming um, what we call our terms of reference. Um, and I think um, your worship um, and um, uh, Peter, at some stage there will be these terms of reference coming back to, to you for some commentary around um, or acceptance of the uh, the level of involvement. I think it, it needs to be approved and, and signed off on that um, and making sure also that it's consistent with engagement in other forums. So we want to make sure that the wastewater forum and how we're approaching that has a level of consistency with other forums that council were involved in. Hopefully you know, involving the, the, the comms team and, and the iwi representative, there will be that level of uh, consistency anyway. Okay, the next group. Um, the most logical one that we really need help with here is we need to find some cockies that are prepared to put their hand up and say, hey, we want some water. And so there's a, uh, there's a process that we're developing um, you know, quite simply to look for those options. Um, I think there's, a, there's, there's guys out there now that say, yep, I'll have some water. There's a lot of concerns and reservations around nutrient loading and, and what, what's in the wastewater. Um, there's farm management plans. All that discussion needs to be pulled together. Um, but the, the thinking is we need to form a group of, of, of um, like-minded cockies who are not necessarily going to say yes, but they're keen to know more. Um, the intention is that we've got a pipeline between Martin and Bulls. We go one, two K either side of it, invite them to a meeting and say, hey, this is what we're thinking and let's see what comes of it. The, um, the next group is the community. And um, so this has been raised in some of the questions um, we've just heard from, um, but the, the community discussion, I think is, is really important. Not so much in terms of 
defining the, the ultimate direction, but providing an opportunity to be able to share ideas. And so that those rep the, the, the representatives within that group can go back to their, their relevant parties and explain either positively or, or negatively why council are, are, are choosing to go down a certain path, or they can take the technical advice from the, the wider technical team back to their people, their, their, their interest groups for consideration. Um, and there's a whole structure on how you make that work. And there's a, I suppose a little bit of a, a recipe that we've worked for on other projects that actually um, you can use to say, well, this is the collective community voice and this is what the community wants. There's a, there's a, there's a process there to, to go through with that. Um, Hamish, can you just stop for a second? Uh, Councillor Gordon, you had a question. Yes, Hamish, the, the proposal and the outcome that you're putting forward, is it sufficiently flexible enough that in the future, if uh, we as a country move from waste disposal thinking in this space to resource recovery thinking, that we can reapply or use the tools in a different way? You understand where I'm coming from? Yep. Uh, yes, and I, I, I was going to, I wasn't going to be as cocky as to pull you up first time round, but I, I would like to start with a bit of education, if I, if I may, um, and then the education is around changing a mindset that collectively we all have. Um, we've got wastewater that we've produced, it's our ownership to deal with it, and I don't think we should be disposing of it. I think we should be looking at sustainable management of it. And I know that's a bit of jargon, it might sound a bit cliche, but we need to discharge it. There's a, there's a perception that comes with disposal of, hey, let's put it down the pipe, we don't, we don't care where it goes. I think there's a level of ownership that we all have to take. And part of that is, is trying to avoid the use of just simple terms like disposal, because it just, it's quite a negative connotation. I think we should look at using terminology around, hey, how can we look at beneficial use or um, nutrient recovery or, or reusing water? Now, in some cases, though, we need to be realistic that in some cases that may not be possible. In which case, yes, we will have a discharge. It happens to be a discharge where we don't have that, that resource reuse. And that might mean that there is some form of discharge to surface water. Now, if it's peeing down with rain like it has been or down... Palmer's north part of the Manawatu, um, you, you, you can't irrigate to land. And for all intents and purposes, you'd like to store, but you run out of storage. So you will need to look at those other options. But coming back to the question, flexibility is really important. I think um, there needs to be the ability for a particular land use to allow to change over time. And council needs to be mindful that they don't get locked into a situation where they have to stick with a particular land use. And so I think um, in this case, if we've got a pipeline between Martin and Bulls, there's a range of land opportunities, including putting a pipe further out to the coast post uh, beyond Bulls. So I, th I think you're quite right, Councillor Gordon, in terms of uh, looking at multiple opportunities and not necessarily putting all your eggs in one basket. Okay, um, so just, just continuing there, um, the what I've um, uh, shown so far is, is everyone apart from councillors. At, at some stage, we need to do a little bit of ground truthing and come back to council and get council's take on where things are because ultimately at council are going to be making um, decisions and recommendations. And so what we've suggested that um, as we form a, a, a group um, called the Project Update Group, sorry, there's a lot of acronyms here, um, if, if someone can think of a, a better name than PUG, it would be good. Um, but essentially, um, what it, we would like to do is is, is take uh, uh, two, three councillors out of the, this collection of, um, of contributors here and actually have them a bit closer to the action to understand specifically what's going on. And it may be that councillors have a, a, have a specific interest in this, or they may be, you know, the ward may overlap with the areas that we're looking at here. But it's having a councillors that can have a bit more of an in-depth knowledge, and they can test us as a project team as to why we're making certain recommendations or why we're developing certain ideas. I think, Hamish, we have given some thought to that, I think, from memory, and I'd need to go back and check the resolutions, but for instance, we regarded the chair of assets 
as being essential in that space. And I'm not sure whether we mentioned anybody else, but um, that would certainly be um, a <laughs> discussion and, and process. Okay, um, I think there's a question from Councillor Duncan. Thank you, Hamish. Um, my question is, so the project team at this point is um, seven people and you've got two from track. Um, I'm just wondering, can you give me an indication of exactly, or, of you know, an indication is not exactly, um, the number that you're looking at uh, for that, for that overall uh, project group? Yeah, okay. So I think there's a number of different levels here of people that do more or less work. There's some people that sit on the sideline and, and offer some advice, and that might be once every month or every couple of months. There's others that are going to be um, knee deep in it and involved in it on a daily basis. So in terms of a core of people that are dealing with it in a, on a daily basis, there's probably um, the, the ones in the middle, there's uh, say four or five of us. Um, the, the likes of Arno and Laquan and Tiana involved, they're their involvement is probably going to be, um, I wouldn't want to put hours on it, but probably you know, one or two contacts per week. Um, when we start going beyond that and start dealing with iwi engagement in the community, um, that might be you know, once a month, once every couple of months. Um, the community program that I'd like to suggest that we can maybe come back to that is looking at a series of engagement of, of helping to develop a recommendation from the community, which might take a series of, say, five meetings over, this, over the course of, um, say, two or three months. And so that might be a, 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 an evening meeting, a couple of hours, and you do it every three or four weeks. And just a really short burst, get some good feedback, get some good um, thoughts and opinion, and then they may, not have, they may have a lesser role, so they may not continue for the duration of the project or or they might sit, step back and, and only be engaged every six months. Okay, thank you. Right, um, so the, the, you know, the, the, the bit that's missing from that is, is the councillors and it's the, the feedback to the councillors. And I think uh, this discussion, it's just taking up a, a few minutes now. You know, the, as, a, as a council, you've got a lot of other things to debate other than wastewater. So the thinking was to be able to utilise the, uh, the pug to, to basically give the, the councillors a level of assurance, uh, the councillors as a whole, a level of assurance that the team was um, was tracking well, um, developing ideas that were consistent with what council would like to see achieved. Right, so um, yeah, just in terms of the purpose then of the PUG, um, basically it's the exchange of information, um, membership, we've, we've talked about that with uh, your, your honour and um, councillors, uh, Mano and myself. Um, there, there may be from time to time need to bring other people in um, on standby, we have, uh, um, Arno had previously um, engaged a, a number of other senior uh, wastewater professionals around the country to provide overarching input as needed. So if there's a particular issue or we need a, a sounding board for someone external, um, it might be that we, we can't reach consensus within our team or you know, differing views, we have the ability to call on some others that are very familiar with these processes. Um, in terms of the pug discussion, I think um, we've got a first first couple of meetings. It'd be quite good to get through in the next couple of months. Um, but one of the challenges that uh, you may want to think about is, is from a um, election cycle. We're coming into the um, the uh, election time. How, how do you want to manage those meetings? Is that something you want to put off off until after the general um, local body elections, or do we uh, continue business as usual? Um, so, just, Hamish, before we go much further, can I just ask the Chief Executive um, whether he has any thoughts around this process or wants to comment further around uh, councillor involvement, that sort of process? Um, thank you, Worship. I, I, um, a, a similar uh, group has been set up for the Martin Rail Hub. Um, you recall this was called an advisory board um, and it contained some expert advisors uh, as well as elected members which gave advice to uh, our council and so the governance sat with council but the advisory board gave us some, some expert advice. Um, 
I do recall, and forgive me for not being prepared to answer this question, Your Worship, I do recall a similar <coughs> advisory board was uh, discussed by council and approved by council um, many months ago. Um, I do not know the status of that board and how that sits presently with this. Um, I would need to check and get back to you, but I, I believe that was a sort of a question you asked earlier. Yeah, thank you very much. I had that in, in mind. Um, that doesn't mean to say that, that the format or the way that it would has been set up <coughs> is not without review, um, because obviously we certainly don't want two parallel processes yeah. occurring here. So can we just leave it with um, Hamish and yourself to come back to council and look at those resolutions that have been made and see how it would could or could not be dovetailed into this process. Yep. Um, Your Worship, the, um, the, the, that advisory board has been on the radar um, and, and, and I might be able to fill the gaps here in terms of the, the status of it, but we're aware that the, the, the makeup of that, and that's, I referred to some external advisors previously, they were part of that board. That board hasn't uh, got together, they haven't, it hasn't actually been formed and um, there's been um, no first meeting, you might say. So uh, there is an opportunity to sort of restructure, restructure or just tweak that. Um, however, it'd be good to actually know the, the actual status of that before we go much further. And, and, and integrate it into this. We don't we don't we don't need duplication, and we um, and we we need to streamline processes and not make meetings for the sake of meetings. We spend enough time in meetings. Sorry. Totally agree. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I mentioned before about uh, the meeting with Track. Um, yeah, I, I think it was actually a very positive meeting. was was really good. Um, we've got uh, Chris Shenton and um, I might need help here, Kim. Um, from one of the, the, the Marae, um, yeah, great. Um, we, what we're trying to do is just organise initial hui with them and uh, look at probably having a wider hui involving the relative um, um, Marae to just ensure that what we're developing in terms of ideas and, con um, and, 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 and thinking is consistent with, it takes into account local tikanga um, and there is an understanding of the challenges that we have in some cases to meeting cultural aspirations and so it's it's a, it's a learning exercise between both uh, the next one community engagement we, we've touched on this um the, the thinking and the, the the recipe that i've used in the past is, is basically to not necessarily select a person but select representation from the community where we have um business owners you'll have uh, someone from the senior community someone from the um, junior community you might um, the youth community um, you might have um, some uh, environmental groups you've got tangata whenua involved and you bring them all together and you give them an opportunity to share ideas and a really important part of that is allowing the ideas of one group to be uh, expressed or discussed with the other groups from a, a good example was from a Tangata Whenua perspective, the ideal is that we don't have any wastewater going into surface water. Some people might find that is, um, it could be challenging. Um, there is some debate on that around cost and the practicality of doing it. So it's a really good community forum to be able to have that debate in, in a small group and then allow that information to then pass back to a, a wider audience. Um, coming out of those discussions is also resources in terms of uh, information and, and some very simple reporting that can then be shared with the wider community. And so one of the, the, the processes that sits alongside this is around the comm strategy of how you share that information. And how, how do you pass it on? Do you, you know, send out uh, flyers? Do you put it on the website? Um, and you, you go door to door and knock on doors and see what people think. So there's a, a number of um, options there. Okay, farmer engagement. Um, I've covered this a little bit before. Basically, we've got a pipeline. Um, you know, the, the basic thinking is you go 2K either side of that pipeline, knock on some doors, get get the guys together and say, right, hey, what are our opportunities? And I think that's the most logical starting point. Yeah. Right, so, so just to wrap it up, really, the, the, the questions, and this is really um, to put it back to the, to the council. Um, really keen to hear and, and um, get feedback on comments on the structure and, and the planning today. 
Um, also sort of related to that is the, some of the ideas around engagement. Um, there's a lot of thinking that has gone into that. So I haven't shared much of the way of the, the detail. So there's, um, we're effectively created or put together some terms of reference that we're refining. Um, yes, we, we can come back to and spend some more time on that if needed. But I think that the last point here is given that we have um, talked about forming this this uh, council or represent, representation group or representative group, the, the PUG, um, as a council, what level of reporting do you want? Um, how much information do you need and would you like to see and, and at what frequency to be assured that the project's on, on task or on time to budget and all the other associated accountabilities that go with that? So I'll, um, I'll, I'll wrap it up there and, and happy to receive uh, further questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hamish. In terms of the reporting back to council, I think probably the, the PUG group um, and the chief executive, we can design a reporting structure um, there and then present that to council and adopt it as a process. Does the council have... Yeah, that would also, be, that's what I would have thought would have been the process similar to what's happening with the Martin Rail Hub, you worship, as a suggestion. And that's what I said as well. Councillor Dalgetty. I'd just like to um, take the opportunity to thank Hamish. I think it's been a really excellent and comforting um, display of your plan and, and it certainly has um, brought a lot of trust for me into the process. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Councillor Wilson, Councillor Belsham, Councillor Wilson. Um, thank you, Wish. Just a, just a quick one, um, Hamish, and, and yes, my thanks as well. Uh, we have seen documents and your presentations come to us uh, when, when, with your engagement with, uh, with Council has been, has been seen. Um, one thing, how many projects like this have you done which have been Council related? Have you done something that's really, really closely aligned to this project that we're engaging in? Um, yeah. Um... Which one shall I pick? Um, so Central Hawke's Bay. Um, Central Hawke's Bay, we're in the process. There's, there's three main wastewater programs going on there at the moment. Well, there's actually, yeah, the th three main wastewater programs. So the first one is uh, Waipak, Waipawa and Aitane, looking at uh, ultimately connect, collecting or connecting them together, um, going to a new wastewater treatment plant and a new discharge system. So that's, uh, that's one example. Um, if we head out to the coast from uh, um, from Waipak, you've got uh, Prongaho and Prongaho Beach or Tiparahi. Um, they both individually have discharges. Uh, Tiparahi discharges from a, a simple oxidation pond into sand dunes, um, and Prongaho goes to the oxidation pond into the Prongaho River. Um, we're in the process of the latter stages of the resource consenting, putting a pipe between the two and irrigating all that wastewater to a, a sheep and beef farm. Um, and basically in between those two communities. Um, the, the consenting process so far with that is interesting. It's a very um, parochial community. Um, they have strong views. Um, we have had six submissions, th three submissions in support, uh, three opposing. The three opposing are basically from the same Tangata Whenua group who um, that they're, they're on board that is uh, ensuring that they have the necessary cultural monitoring in place. So the, the reason for highlighting that is it's demonstrating that consenting processes don't need to be challenging. I think there's probably more challenges dealing with the regional council than there is dealing with submitters. Um, Thank you, that's, that's answered my question and it just tells me that you're well abreast of the uh, complications of putting a project like this together. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. I think Hamish should be nice idea at some stage if councillors could actually go and look at a scheme that is running and start to understand probably something that would be comparable to to what we could end up with but also an understanding of schemes the schemes that haven't worked quite as well and what the pitfalls have been i think is is probably even more important yeah Oh, most definitely, and I think um, there is a level of frustration I know that I, I share um, where council invests a lot of time and money in shiny bums like myself giving advice for systems that cost a lot of money that then fall over. 
Um, and we need to look at the reasons why they fall over and they, they do fall over. And there's, in my view, there's very logical reasons that they fall over. And as part of this package, we need to make sure that we have safeguards so they don't fall over. So yeah, more than happy to share views and, and show examples of that as well. Yeah, because those stories circulate within communities. Mm. Uh, and you're right, there are a number that don't perform at the level that they should be. And understanding that, and then being able to <coughs> respond to people who bring up these case studies and say, such and such a scheme is a waste of time, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that would be very useful. Councillor Belsham, I think you had a question. Yeah, just in regards with the reporting, um, currently we receive a, a monthly report through the PMO office, and, and this is one of the projects. Um, I guess we're not looking at changing that structure a great deal, are we? I mean, I think if we have the Rail Hub Advisory Board, but it still reports back through this PMO office, and I think that information that is provided in this monthly report is, is ample, so, yeah. If I may reply, Your Worship, what we have in mind is to stick to the PMO report so we're not duplicating the mm. uh, at a high level back to Council, but we want to give Council the confidence that there are representatives more in the nuts and bolts that can ask the really hard questions and thrash out all the real details so that whatever information that we bring up to council at a high level the details be thrashed out so also if you have a question you can channel that via those members that will be on that group uh, and it gives you the Just opportunity to really dig into the details secretary to that the, the <coughs> members on that group um rather than waiting for an election process are you would you not be better to name the positions rather than like the chair of assets, chair of finance, or, or something with that type of um, yeah. input and, and skill set to sit on those on those boards. So then it doesn't matter who who gets elected in, it's who sits on that position that actually sits on that board. Yeah, I totally agree that they, they should be by position. Yeah. Um, but for instance, whoever is mayor will be sitting down with the chief executive councillors and, and presenting to councillors their preferred process around structure. So there is a, a potential over that if there. You know, so um, that's just a process that they have the right to do. Well, thank you, Hamish. Um, I echo the sentiments of Councillor Dalgetty, um, it does give us sort of a sense of confidence around the, the, the linking of all of these little sub-projects together and the coordination of it with communities, etc. Um, I appreciate the, the spaghetti junction that you've put in place, <laughs> and I'm not quite sure how you wove that together, but maybe we'll understand it in time. Any last comment from Arno? Chief Executive, for questions? Um, I would hope you wish it from um, the confidence that your the elected members have shown in, in the presentation. It also answers the question, why have we not bought land? Uh, and, and you'll see the process that we feel now should be undertaken, which is being undertaken, which you previously resolved, uh, and why that answers that question, which you may be asked in the community. <coughs> Okay, would somebody move recommendation one that the project management have to do that? No, it's no, it's not. That's, you've just dropped it in front of me. That's yeah, sorry. I was wondering why it was there. No. Well, thank you very much. And we'll move on. Okay. Right. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillors. Right. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Well, move to the Chief Executive's report. This is 9.1. Um, would somebody like to move a reception of it? Councillor Lambert, Councillor Belton, those in favour? Uh, uh, those against? Carried. Thank you. Move to the Chief Executive. Thank you, Your Worship. I will have contributions from some of my team as I go through it. Uh, I'll first I'll take it as read, uh, and I would presume that um, elected members have read the Health and Safety Report. I'll pause there to ask if there are any questions to the report. Councillor Ash. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the report, um, Peter. Always a good read. Um, 
just uh, I've got a couple of things. Do you want them all together and then answer them, or one at a time? Um, uh, uh, I would presume you're only referring to point three, the health and safety report. Oh no, sorry, it was just part of your um, CE report. It can wait if you're just going over health and safety. That's fine. Yeah, so I'll go through um, the different sections and then um, I'll pause at the end of each section that I want to discuss. And if there's anything else after that that I haven't touched, we'll be very happy to answer questions. Go ahead with that, Your Worship. Yeah, more than happy. So, any, any sure. questions? Thanks. Point three, which is the health, safety, and wellbeing updates. Councillor Gordon. Yeah, um, Peter, we've got this, what looks like a massive jump in abusive behaviour in July. I mean, what's gone down? Is this happening to staff at our front of house or is this in the broader community? Um, th thank you for, for this. So, so this section would normally be run by Sharon. Um, she's uh, away today and can't be here, sadly. Um, for the, she has in prepared me for that question. Um, so three events sat in the abusive behaviour category. Um, one event happened at Tamata uh, and two within community housing. Um, I would add to that, um, um, myself and the exec team have empower are empowering our people to report this, um, as I would encourage elected members should that apply to, to you. Um, this is an often overlooked part of the um, mental well-being of my people. Uh, and too often I've heard of my staff being intimidated or abused and they shrug their shoulders and go, Tuh, that's part of the job. Uh, I find that unacceptable as the chief executive uh, and wish to ensure that we capture these so we have the data to enable myself and the executive team to address it. I'd also just like to thank the CE for the, um, the work as, as done session. I found that very valu valuable. Um, yeah, look, looking inside the depot and looking on the inside. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And uh, um, I know my staff were delighted for those members who are able to turn up. They're very proud of what they do in this area and to uh, showcase it to you was um, what was um, reported favourably back to me. One quick one for me, through you, uh, your worship, mate. Um, I suspect I know the answer to it, and I hope this is the answer that you're going to give me, Peter, um, with regards to the motor vehicles at five, and noting that we had some driver training and stuff put in place, I think, recently. Where is that? What's What underlies that one? And then also I'll, I'll let you answer before I give you what I think the answer should be. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. You're always on the fringe of a difficulty here. When... Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm unable to answer that question as to what those events and their misses are over the course of the last uh, year. I mean, that's five incidents. I do know, um, and I'd look to some of my other executive team members if they recall, I do know one was reversing into something, one was a... Mm. Uh, a door flung open that's by the wind, the wind right, um, yeah. that kind of, that kind of, uh, uh, Gaylene or Dave or Katrina did. One was a trailer. Yeah, one was a trailer, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry to not have that. No, 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 that's a bit of a leading question. Was that the right answer, <laughs> Councillor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll let that one slide. <laughs> it doesn't leave you with a lot of room to go. No, no, that's fine. Oh. But that, that is the information that you had previously supplied us. I was just wondering if that was an increase over the last month, but I now suspect that I'm wrong in that. <coughs> Thank you. We'll move. Yeah, we'll so move that, that's for the full year. Mm. Thank yeah. you. We'll move on. Thank you, Worship. Um, I'll move um, forward in my report to uh, point or oh, section seven, which is the transition funding uh, on three waters. You will see there that. Um, uh, last week we've been offered uh, 353,000 um, to support uh, resources to, uh, to help in the transition. Um, we're just currently going through that offer now and how we may implement that uh, as an operational team um, and we'll advise you there of that in due course. 
a couple of questions, Your Worship. This is part of the 44 million that the Prime Minister announced uh, to help the transition. Councillor Belsham. Well, yeah, just a question in regards with that last line on 7.2, complying with the terms of funding. So the terms of funding to date, do they look quite uh, restrictive or are they fairly open? Um, the initial view, <coughs> excuse me, the initial view I've had is that they, they are fairly mild uh, and don't invoke any onerous obligations on council. One of the keys to the information I've read so far is that it doesn't inhibit or prohibit council from expressing a view of, that's contrary to the, the, um, the reform. Uh, that's been explicit, um, but I am reviewing that um, with a view to meeting with my team next Wednesday to go through it. And a future report to the council? Uh, if you'd like. Uh, I think if it's more than my delegation, but I think it's common sense that I'd, I'd bring it to council for your information on the last, yes. Thank you. Thank you. The Prime Minister was quite explicit in a recorded conversation that council will that that where it says that you shouldn't be criticising, that that is not the case. I, I may just rescind my earlier answer to, to and Deputy Mayor. Um, <coughs> this is a contract that's in excess of my delegation. It will naturally have to come back to Council for your approval. Thank you. Um, Councillor Ash, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Um, my first question is actually about number five, if I may, um, Mr. Beggs, um, in regards to submissions. Wondering if there's a possibility of um, submissions to central government or um, yeah, things that we can comment on coming through elected councillors first. Uh, just there may be some things that um, staff might not um, think that we want to submit on and elected councillors actually may wish to submit on some of those um, opportunities. So is, is that a possibility that that's put forward in front of elected members um, first? Um, as part of the process going forward, that list was going to be run, I think, through me as well. So, for instance, if I see, if I see any potential um, where councillors can be interested, I may well go out to councillors and seek that um, view. Yeah. Can I actually ask that that is in front of all councillors as well? Because with all due respect, um, it, it, everybody has different opinions and so I, I, I dare say you're not able to understand where every elected member's thinking is at. So it would be really, really good if all elected members had an opportunity to to say whether or not they'd like to see a submission put in. But I certainly take that comment on board, Councillor, and, and I'll pass to the Chief Executive for comment around that. But there's a very large number of submissions. Mm, uh, I are, totally appreciate that, that yeah. Are only, that are only applicable, for instance, to um, and metros that we just mm. literally are not in that space. Mm, mm. I totally appreciate that. Um, yes, sorry, um, section 14 of my report addresses this very question. So if it's okay, Councillor, we may come back to that at section 14 because there is a resolution around it as well. Um, okay. It's going to take us through that. Sure, um, so I did have something on seven, if, if I may. Just wondering, um, what message is it giving if we are to accept that 350? To me, I find it quite repugnant. It feels like um, sort of greasing of palms almost, given the very strong statement that we had in our submission, uh, saying that we, we didn't feel comfortable with the reform. Um, and so therefore, if we accept this funding, is that obligating us to um, going through with the reform as it stands or in any form at all? Um, I just, I, I'm really apprehensive about us receiving um, funding. As, as exciting as it might be to be getting funding, I, I am very apprehensive about the obligations it may um, 
come with? Um, Councillor Ash, we have obligations by way of impending law. So it's sort of like you're suggesting that we have a decision to make we don't have a decision to make, it is becoming law, and there are obligations associated with that law. If you wanted to put a motion on the table to say that we should not accept um, support funding, you'd be more than welcome to do that. But however, I do note that the councils, for instance, and councils for local democracy, um, the councils that were looking to say so we'll pull out of local government, um, they are all accepting that funding as far as I know it. Um, and there are a number of councils that were at local government conference um, who have signalled an intent not to be part of local government who made the decision that they need to be in the tent. Mm, totally appreciate that. My question was, if we receive this money, what message is that giving? Give. I'm not suggesting we don't. I'm just asking the question, what message is it giving and does it obligate us to do anything in particular? That's... Well, the obligation is totally that we have to follow the law in terms of uh, the law that's laid out by government. Um, I'm not sure that I can be explained any other way. Um, Your Worship, I asked the question around what the terms of funding required and the Chief Executive uh, had explained that a report would come back to Council and I'm presuming would actually state what what implications come with accepting that, uh, that funding. So that's still a report to come in front of Council. I, that's my understanding of the Chief Executive's answer. Um, Thank you very much, and I do accept that that's a better answer than I've given. Um, I'm certain that there will be obligations within that funding to provide information, for example. Thank you. Um, so I'll move to point eight, um, which is a, an initiative that's been set up by, bless you, by, uh, by Galen's team. Um, what that does is allow a point of contact or a single point of contact uh, from Galen's team to work with each of our community committees and community boards. Um, Galen is just making sure that the purpose of that is made really clear in terms of what it is and what it is not. And what it is is a conduit for the community committees and boards into council. Uh, and to streamline some of those processes which um, you have seen as elected members being asked to approve what you would determine very, very minor things that would normally fall, not even in my basket, but it was my, my executive team. Um, so that's the purpose of it. What it's not, to be clear, it's not a fast track for those things. Uh, naturally, things would occur quicker, but it's not a fast tracking, and it's not a replacement of the request for service system. So we're, we're using this as a, a way, and I applaud Gaylene for her leadership on this, um, that uh, of a way of increasing the engagement we have, council has with those committees. Thank you. Um, I'll go Councillor Gordon, Councillor Duncan, then myself, Councillor Gordon. Yeah, through you, Worship, um, Chief Executive's comment, look, I fully endorse it. We, we really need to have a consistent um, consistent messaging going out to community committees and boards yes. and we need to empower that person to take sometimes quite high level stuff in there um, if, if I might look back over my time that I've sat on the Taihebi community board you know, we had the we had the two I see from council Mr Hodder in there and that gave a, a very high level of experience and authority to actually um, inform um, and, and, and that, you know, as, a, as an elected person, that was wonderful. And it was great for that community. I mean, the fact that many members of the community chose not to go and sit in on board meetings and, and actually get up skilled and, and learn is, is their problem. But, um, you know, fully endorse um, the actions you're taking. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Duncan. 
Yes, here, here. Um, that's exactly what I wanted to say. I think this is very exciting and much needed and um, feeding straight into um, the best part of what local government reform will, will bring to our communities. Thank you. Um, go Councillor Dalgetty ahead of me. Councillor. Oh, sorry, you, right. Your Worship. Um, in terms of the Hunterville Community Committee, I still am uncomfortable around um, the typing of the minutes, unfortunate as it is. Currently our <coughs> chair does that. Um, she takes the minutes, she chairs the meeting, and then she does the, um, types them up afterwards. And I just, I, I feel that that puts a lot on that chair. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Do you wish to respond? I know that. Thank you. I endorse this as a principle. I think one of the things that um, <coughs> we need to think a little bit more further around as to what delegations we could potentially give to these committees. At the, at the moment, their delegation power is zil. <coughs> Literally, it's about suggesting street names, etc. Mm. And if I was, um, you know, a young professional person, I'd be sitting in these committees frustrated. Mm. And that we should look to see where we can widen potentially their powers. Um, <coughs> if I may conclude on that, Your Worship, I think Gaylene, um, I trust she's heard those last two points, well, all of the points that have been raised uh, and empower our people that are attending these to be listening to the will of the community. And if that means one of the committees is seeking further powers or another committee is seeking support in terms of minute taking that we should be listening and bringing that back for for um, a decision either by myself or, or, or elected members. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, point nine fluoridation I believe we've already discussed um, earlier in the meeting. Um, point 11, Gailene can you please update us on the Springvale Bridge toilet? Thank you Peter. Um, so Council has been successful in having their application approved. What's different about this um, funding from the tourism, tourism Infrastructure Fund compared to other years is that it's actually a two-stage process. In the past, they've given us the funding and then we've reported back to them at the end. This time, they've actually given us additional funding than what we requested, and it is for us to get our consents and do any necessary consultation first and then take that back to be approved before we get the final um, approval. Um, to this end, obviously initially with the discussion, the toilet is on private land, so we did have that written confirmation from the landowner, but now we're just going through the stages of formalising that agreement. We've also spoken with the Upper Rangitike um, catchment group. They were also looking at developing that area. And so um, the consultation with them and their work was also included in the application. So we're just having further discussions in that area as well. Thank you. Um, a comment from me, Gaylene, uh, and you'll be, you know these people, uh, you're well aware of the locations, but if we put the toilet in there as we will, we need to recognise the effort that Warren Connor went through and the service that he gave to our community. I'm not sure naming a toilet after something <laughs> is quite the right space, but it's possibly something that you could work with Simon over. Um, yes. Because I'm not sure if councillors are aware, you had, in this case, a landowner who said, not only will I put a toilet in there, but I will personally go down and service it. Um, it was an amazing gesture over a very long time. Mm -hmm. And we need to absolutely publicise and recognise that. And, and it was certainly a joint effort too um, with Otupai Station. Um, yeah. They both put considerable work into that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Angus, Councillor Gordon, sorry. Your, your Worship. Um, 
if I may, Gailene, there are some tourism operators that will have been um, key users of that site. So if you wish me to provide your, um, their names to you, to, to look to, you know, as part of the consultation mechanism, then I can probably um, find at least three or four names that you need to talk to or might be useful to talk to. Thank you. Um, I understand through Simon Plummer that a number of them are involved in the upper catchment group. Um, so I'm just waiting for confirmation on who is on that group. Thank you. But yes. thank you. Yes, they are. <laughs> Councillor Ash. Thank you. Um, great work, uh, uh, Ms. Prince. Um, and thanks for clarifying the extra 25%. I was, I did have a question around that, um, wondering why there was there was so much more money, uh, more than we'd re requested. So is that enough to cover the consultation? And is that standard 25% a standard fee that government just pays for consultation? I am not sure if that is standard across everybody's um, applications, but I believe it will cover our costs, yes. I just, I just wonder, Gary, Thank you. that with this toilet, we should also be looking at what ancillary um, service stuff could be of use there. For instance, um, from memory, and I've stopped there a few times, you know, people like their little fires, and things, um, whether there's a, there's no barbecue area, there's no stones, there's no tables and things that I can immediately think of there. But if we're going to upgrade the services there, what else is required? And some of that upgrading was allowed for, sorry, um, in our initial, I'm not sure what's happening there, in our initial, um, application. Thank you. Thank you from both of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, sorry, I shouldn't be flipping that count. Thank you, Worship. I'm not sure if you addressed it, Gailene, but <clears throat> for the remainder, is that covered in our annual plan? Yes, it is. Thank you. Uh, point 13, real estate agents feedback. Some good work from Gailene's team on this as well. Um, and just just regarding more broadly housing, uh, His Worship and I uh, met with Habitat for Humanity and Door of Hope uh, this week. Um, we are, of course, uh, as part of annual plan resolutions, meeting with uh, Iwi, uh, with Ngā Waikinati Apa in particular, around housing. Um, and so there's, there is progression uh, on that. Uh, point four, 14, um, Katrina, could you, I ask you to run through that, which is a link to what Councillor Ash was discussing earlier. Yes, certainly. Um, so as you're aware, there's a lot coming out, um, particularly from central government um, at us at the moment. So what we wanted to do was formalise the process a bit for the consideration of those responses by Council. Um, in response to Councillor Ash's comment earlier, what we're proposing is a monthly update to Council on future um, in open consultations as part of the Chief Executive Update so that you're seeing those monthly. Um, we've noted that where possible, the intention would be to put the draft submission um, on a council agenda for approval to submit, but noted that quite often the submission timeframes are quite tight, um, so that that might not be possible. So we've suggested a recommendation um, that delegations provided to the Mayor and Chief Executive um, but on the basis that submissions will be run past full council first. Um, so there is a recommendation below to that effect. Um, the update is attached as attachment four in terms of what's out there at the moment. Um, and there's three other attachments sitting there for you. Mm -hmm. So there's two that have already been submitted, the Water Services Entities Bill and the National Policy Statement on Indigenous Biodiversity. But there's also a draft submission sitting there for you today, the Electoral Māori Option Legislation Bill, which effectively allows voters to change between the Māori and general electoral roles significantly easier. So that draft submission is written in support of that. Did you want to touch the recommendations now? Yeah, yeah. If, if we could um, touch on those would recommendations. Would somebody like to move or, or suggest another recommendation? Councillor Gould? Oh, we've received it. No, we haven't. 
Yeah, that's done. So recommendation yeah, two, this is about um, the delegate yeah. authority. For, are you happy to move? Yes, I'm happy to sequence. Yeah. Councillor Wilson seconding. Do you wish to speak to it? No. Are there okay. any questions or speakers to it? Councillor Ash? I'm still just a little bit unsure as to whether or not that allows scope for elected members to at least have a look at the list for sub, um, of potential submissions. Has, has that got enough scope to allow for that? And so that they'd be aware of things that are coming up on the horizon. Um, Councillor Ashaik, the suggestion is that all, full council receives a monthly update on the council agenda. Were you after a different frequency than that, or are you <coughs> satisfied with that monthly update? The monthly update would be great, as long as within council, from that monthly update, if there's any elected members that actually wanted to see a submission, um, could put that to the vote at the table at the time. So yeah, no, that will that will cover it. Thank you. Yeah, just bearing in mind, sometimes just the timing of these submissions, yeah. we can't take it through to council literally, but we would put it out to councillors for comment in terms of that. Um, any other speakers? No right or reply. I'll put it to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? Carried. Thank you. And the next one is to approve the submission on, on the electoral uh, legislation bill with or without amendment. Um, Turner, do you wish to, I know you, you've explained it, do you wish to add anything to it or are there any questions from councillors? So essentially this legislation enables people to elect far more readily and freely the ability to opt between the two roles in elections. Councillor Duncan, and I'll go. Yes, thank you. So I really, I'm a bit hazy on this one. I couldn't really get my head around it. Um, but you're saying that, and it's not going to apply to these elections because it won't come through in time. But uh, you're saying that if someone comes to a general election or a local government election in future, that they will then be able to, if they're already on the Māori ward or on the general ward they'll be able to swap over if, if they are of Māori descent for within that election or or decide to be on the electoral roll on the main role one time and then the next time they might want to be on the Māori roll. Is that, is that correct? It would have to be ahead of the electoral roll being printed as I understand it but provided that could be achieved the answer would be yes. That clarifies it. Thank you. Councillor Rokawa, question? Um, I, I thought it was of the understanding that uh, the voters on the Māori electoral roll, um, my understanding of that submission was to be able to say um, whether it is in a general election or, a, um, or our local elections, you could decide. Was I Did I read there or you could decide whether you wanted to change over to the Māori role for any of those elections or was a submission just for our local elections? I think you've got it right. Yeah. Councillor Wilson. I'm just happy to move the motion without amendments. I think we can speak to the motion. Yeah. Have we got a second to it? Oh, okay. Councillor Lambert, because you're next door. <laughs> Councillor Wilson. Uh, no, I don't wish to speak to it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you wish to speak, Councillor Lambert? No, no, no. Uh, any questions or speakers to the motion? Right, I'll put it straight to a vote. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Carried. Next one. Oh, yes, sorry, still with me, Your Worship. Um, uh, the final one is point 15, which is a fee waiver. Uh, it's out of my delegation. I'm sorry for. Huntable Huntaway Festival. Um, resolutions, uh, the recommendation is the worship for consideration. Yeah, this is something that comes up every mm. single time, but we need to deal with it. 
Um, does anybody have a view? Does anybody wish to put one of those motions forward and then we're discussing something that is there? Councillor Duncan. You're on mute, Councillor. Well, I'm happy to move this because it's it's come up now, but I would like to see that liquor licensing isn't the sort of thing that we would normally um, waive because it's it's not a really good look. Um, but I would I want to support this festival, so I'm not speaking against supporting them, but I would like to see that we could look at supporting it some other way rather than the liquor licensing. Um, we probably do support in other ways with event funding mm -hmm. uh, as the answer to that. But I'm really wanting somebody to put a motion on the table for discussion. Councillor Lambert. Yes, I'll move the council approves the waiver 100% of the $475 of the special licence fee the Hannibal Highway Festival Committee. Have we a seconder to that? Councillor Dalgetty seconding it. Any questions before I ask for people to speak to it? No? Any speakers to it? I'll go to you, Councillor Lambert. Oh, no, just to say it's a regular event and it's very, very important to that, that part of the region. And um, I think the more more support we can give, the better. Any other speakers? Councillor Duncan. In the case, I'll have to speak against it because I think the problems that came from this festival was all around liquor. Um, and I think there were two or three occasions last year and so if, if we want to support them, I would really like to see we do it in a different way. Councillor Ash. I'm agreeing with uh, Councillor Duncan's um, views on this as well. I do think there's other ways that we can support it and we do support it already. Um, I, I think it's a, an amazing opportunity for the, for the district, um, but this isn't a way that I think that we should be seem to be supporting it. So okay, two, two speakers against, one speaker for. <coughs> Any other speakers? Councillor Dalgetty. I am speaking in favour of the motion. Uh, this, I believe, is their 25th year. It is a great event in our district that attracts a lot of people from out of town. And there is a well-being com component around the ability for people to get together and and celebrate what a great place we live in. And uh, we need to do everything we can to encourage these sort of events to happen. Before I go to Councillor Wilson, that's 242 against. Before I go, I'll just ask a question of staff, which may be a little bit difficult to answer. They are in receipt of event funding from council, I believe. Mm -hmm. Is there any way of being able to tell me whether the funding they're already receiving uh, is to help cover their liquor licence? There's no possibility of a double dip here. Um, you, you, if I may, uh, uh, Ash should be able to answer that. Um, can you do that quickly? Yeah, yeah, I'll just need a couple of minutes. Yeah. Um, sure. While Ash is, is considering that, Your Worship, um, we uh, the, this committee has also uh, agreed, I think, for payment of the fee for the erection of the tent, if I recall correctly. So there are other ways. Okay. Marky, thank you. Um, so there are other ways. And again, uh, just to tread some water while Ash is doing that, uh, just to acknowledge your earlier comment regarding um, uh, about the small nature of being brought to this committee. We are currently reviewing the delegations register to avoid this sort of thing in the future. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. Uh, yeah, pleasing to hear that that's, uh, the delegations register has been reviewed. Um, this is a application um, for a waiver of the fee. It is not an application for a waiver of the licence. The application still requires <coughs> to be put in place and within that there are requirements that need to be met uh, by the regulatory body. So we're talking about a waiver of the fee, not a waiver of the licence. So I do not have an issue with the fee being waived at 100%, so I'll be speaking for the motion. So we have now have three speakers for, two against. Is there anybody else wishing to speak against the motion? Councillor Gordon. Yes, I will, Your Worship. I'm going to speak against because 
this is not the only community group that applies for a special license to serve alcohol. And it is, and it is very common. In fact, if we look back through in the order paper, there is a um, part of the order paper that actually lists all the licenses that we provide to numerous groups throughout the year. And you know, the, the serving of alcohol is part of what I might call the fundraising that many, many <coughs> groups use, and they all pay their fee. They pay their fee. I, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I share Councillor Duncan and Councillor Ash's misgivings about about this. I, I think I think there's a certain responsibility that goes with serving of alcohol, and I think this is one that we shouldn't actually support them on in terms of a fundraising mechanism. This is about, you know, this this will go into their fundraising ultimately. They'll be five hundred dollars, five hundred seventy-five dollars better off. So I'm going to vote against on this one. Have we got an answer to the question? Uh, yeah, not specifically. So their expenditure included the bar, but um, the funding provided to them was only 7,000 and their total expenditure was around 100,000. So it yeah. wasn't specified whether or not. Yeah. So we've given them 7,000 through the events sponsorship, True. but it didn't specify that that was to help cover their liquor license. True. That was the thing that I just wanted to check. <laughs> right. We've had speakers for and against. I go back to the mover for a right of reply for debate. Yeah, I, just to clarify, Councillor Duncan, the event actually hasn't been held for a couple of years because of COVID. And um, I believe it has pleased very, very well. The, um, I'm not there, certainly not there much after the clock strikes 10 these days, but I believe that, um, that they've made a very, very conscious effort um, about the sale and distribution of alcohol <coughs> behaviour. And um, I, I'd still, obviously, very much in favour of waiving the fee. As Councillor um, Wilson pointed out, it is just for the licence fee, not the serving of alcohol. We've now had a right of reply. I must put it to the vote. Can I have a show of hands? Those in favour? Those against? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, the motion is lost. Thank you. And um, I can accept the, the, the arguments that have been put on the table. Made sense. Thank you. Good debate. And you, may, you wish it for the you may still need to deal with. Does that mean that? Um, Recommendation four drops in does not support. That correct. would be a secondary so, recommendation. So that, that motion is, is you know, absolutely correct. The move to accept it um, was lost and therefore would need a motion that council does not approve the waiver. Somebody like to put that motion in Councillor Gordon moving, second to Councillor Belsham. I think this is pro forma and just do it. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Carried. Thank you. Um, we're due for a break at three o'clock. Um, we're a couple of minutes before that. Would you rather deal with the next item or, do, or have your break for now? Which is the next item, sir? You wish it. Uh, Kiwi Bear, remittance of fees request. Uh, right, a rule from the chair will carry on. It's not quite through. Could somebody move that the report be received, please? Councillor Duncan, Councillor Wilson, those in favour? <coughs> those against? Carried. Is there somebody that, that can take us through this? Is that you, Patricia? Uh, Dave. Dave. Yeah, I'm uh, presenting this. Um, I think that the paper's fairly self-explanatory. We've been asked if we can um, remit a, um, a resource consent fee. Um, so this is about the two thousand and ninety-six dollars. The percentage of that. Um, would somebody like to put a motion on the table for consideration, Councillor Wilson? Uh, happy to move that we um, remit that at the hundred percent, and I'm happy to speak to the reasons why. So we've got a mover, seconder from somebody. I'll second to get it on the table. Thank you, Councillor Gordon. 
Okay. Um, any questions before we go into debate here? No? Right, Councillor Wilson. Uh, an application came to the Finance Committee by way of event funding, I think, Councillor Belsham, was it? Mm -hmm. Councillor? Mm -hmm. Yep, that was by event funding. And at the time, there was a much, much debate about that request, and that request for funding at the time was turned down with a view that Council could support in another way. Uh, so for those uh, reasons alone, I am supporting the motion to the 100% application uh, based on the fact that that is where we directed this group to go and to come back via another mechanism of Council. So hence my reason for um, moving the motion to support. Councillor Belsham, next speaker. Um, I'll speak against the motion. I would be happy to support to some degree, um, but I think each player needs a piece of skin in the game, and I'd be looking at more around a 50-50 type share arrangement, but um, not to the 100%. So I'm speaking against this motion is foreshadowing. Can I just get a little bit of clarification from staff here? When it came to events sponsorship, um, <coughs> the cost of the resource consenting was estimated at 13,000, something like that. And it was a, a proposal for several thousand, whether three or seven thousand, seven thousand. So I've got my figures around about right in my mind. So the question I ask staff is either that estimate was incredibly wrong or this is for only a part portion of the costs they face um you wish so I, I, can i add there um uh, i've previously declared a potential conflict given that i'm an attendee of the event so this is why i am but i am able to answer your question if you allow me to um, i have no problem with you providing an information without providing an opinion the uh submission to the event sponsorship scheme was for the event in January next year. Okay. This is for the current resource consent uh, that has uh, has been a, um, for this current year, if that makes sense. So there, there are two, looking at two um, different resource consents, uh, one in which they are, are, are slightly increasing the numbers to attend the event uh, for January 2023, and the one that came to the event sponsorship scheme was to uh, even even more than that to to uh, to bring it up to I think 5,000 people. And that figure was 13,000. Correct. So I've got my ducks in a line. Does that change your position? As uh, no, no, Your Worship, it doesn't. Given my earlier statement that we sent the group via this path. So no, it doesn't change my position. They seem to be two different. We're not talking apples and apples, I suspect. Councillor Belsham, does that change your view? Uh, um, no, it doesn't. No. Not for further speakers to the motion. We have one for, one against. Councillor, I'll have Councillor Duncan followed by Councillor Gordon. Councillor Duncan. Um, first of all, um, I just uh, would declare that um, that the landowner is a third cousin of my husband's. I just want to make sure that's not a conflict of interest. Oh, are you asking me to rule on that or give you advice on that? Yes, I'd like you to rule, please. I think um, if you go back seven relationships, everybody's related yes. to everybody, I think it's enough distance to, for me not to be concerned. Thank you. Um, then I would like to speak for this because it says here that these are processing charges um, and that the uh, th this um, applicant has already paid almost $800 of them, uh, as well as I think from what I'm saying. And so the 2096 is an addition. Um, and once again, I remember very clearly that we did refer these um, this group to another form of getting support because it's a fantastic event for the district. And um, once again, we have to support all of these as much as we can. So um, I would like to see us support it. And if this is the way that we can do it, um, and they are our processing charges, then I would like to um, speak for this. 
Thank you. That raises another very interesting point of clarification. And earlier on, a few days ago, when I read this, I put, put a little note aside and I forgot. So the $2,096 that is in the order paper, they've paid 800 odd already. And if, the, if you were going to remit 100% of the 2,096, does that mean that we need to send them back a check for 800, effectively? And we've done that in the past. Just making sure that everybody's aware of the positions here. Councillor Gordon, I think you were next. Yeah, I have a number of questions actually from the answers that the Chief Executive has given. Um, you commented previously before that this is only a portion of the total fees that they are being expected to pay for next year's event. Two separate events, yeah. So, so which fee is this going towards? Next year or this year that was cancelled? I'm <coughs> thinking this year was cancelled. Um, um, the Kiwi Boon wanted to uh, extend the number of people attending the event in terms of what days they will be attending, and that triggered a change to the resource consent. Um, that's now concluded, and it cost Kiwi Boon $2,096 to have that resource consent and that change approved by council. And that is this submission. There was a, sub, a separate submission, which was to grow the event from, I'm gonna use numbers off the top of my head, forgive me if it's not quite right, but from two and a half thousand people to four or 5,000 people. And it was estimated that the resource consent would cost 13,000. And that was the submission that went to um, uh, to, to the um, event sponsorship scheme. So it, it, there was two extensions effectively. Right. Any further speakers? I might ask one more question if I may. Sure. Is this event a profit making event? Can someone. Um, well, um, well what the, the answer to that from my memory, I stand to be correct that essentially, yes, it is. And the short answer, it pays um, money, first of all, to the landowners, which is a cost, but it, re it pays a reasonably significant sum back to the national body of, of um, <coughs> based out of presumably out of America. That is in their budgets for, for the event funding. And they do declare a profit. It's not great, but it is a problem. Mm -hmm. um, that's working from my memory of the event. The Chair of Finance, I've got it about right? Yeah, yeah. The, I'd have to look back at the, <coughs> the exact figures in the application, but yes, yes, it, uh, it does create a profit. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Otherwise, I can act to write a reply and towards the vote. Nobody else want to state their position? Interesting. <laughs> Councillor Wilson. Uh, no right of reply. Let's see if it sinks or swims. Right. No right of reply. We'll put it straight to the vote. Let's go back to the to the motion to. So this is the approval of a remittance of 100% of the $2,096 fee relating to that section for the variation of consent for their 2023 Burning Man event. Those in favour? Those against? Sorry, look, this is going to be a closer on things. Um, those in favour? One, two, three, four. Those against? One, two, three, four, five, is it? Yes. Okay. Um, so Councillor Dalgetty is conflicted. Yeah, Councillor mm -hmm. Dalgetty is not voting because she's conflicted. Mm -hmm. So I have the, I have it as the motion that is lost. Are there any abstentions? No. Thank you very much. Um, there was a foreshadowed motion. Worship. <coughs> Your Worship. There was a foreshadowed motion. I had a foreshadowed motion. Go for it. 
that council approves a remittance of 50% of the $2,096 for fees relating to as the previous submission had, or uh, recommendation had, but 50% of those fees. I'll second the, the, the motion. Um, do you wish to speak to it? Well, yeah, the, I'm speaking and relating back to the letter that they've provided to council that uh, they were asking for an opportunity for the council to subsidise the process by remitting some or all of the fees. And this is uh, this is supporting their request uh, to 50%. So I'd be quite happy uh, as a council to support 50% of that. Thank you. I support that idea. Um, so speaking to it, I, I support it. That's fine. So you've got two in favour. Any other speaker? <coughs> Can I just make a comment? That's what it is. Well, we can try. <laughs> um, I just want to make the comment that um, this, the chair has come to our Hunterville Community Committee mem meeting and offered to support the community. Um, so he's like, while I accept that they're a, a profit uh, making body, they do do their utmost to donate back to the community where they can. Mm. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, and if I remembered yeah. that, I would have um, made a point of that. Um, also, we do provide a reasonable amount of, of other help. You know, part of this road, it's a very high usage, and a lot of that road down is a private road, and as a matter of safety to people in our district, it, more than anything else, we we do grade it, so it's it's out of contract work, if you like, um, and that came originally from my request um, as a service request. Are you quite happy if we put this straight to a vote? Because there was nobody against, no right of vote. Put it to vote. Those in favour. Lots. Carry. <laughs> Thank you. And um, we'll stop for a break now. Um, how about we resume in about 10 minutes? Thank you for those online.
Yeah. Okay, thank you, councillors. Welcome back. Welcome back to those online. Our all online councillors, that's it. We are broadcasting. Move on to 10.2. This is the Mayor's Task Force for Jobs. And who's presenting on this? Gaylene, please. Gaylene. Thank you, Gaylene. Um, over to you. But before you do so, could we have somebody receive the report? Thank you. Councillor Carter and thank you, Councillor Bilton, seconding those in favour. Right, carried, thank you. Bailey. Thank you. Um, so as the Mayor's alluded to in his report, we have got approval um, for Council to enter into another agreement for the Mayor's Task Force for Jobs, um, up to 450,000. So the purpose of this report is to seek approval from Council to enter into that agreement with Local Government New Zealand, and then also to consider um, whether Council endorses the opt-out procurement rule for the procurement policy for the consultant to undertake this work. Sorry, can I, can I just stop you there, Gaylene? Uh, and you, you worship if I may interrupt. Um, uh, Gaylene did send me a message, uh, which I didn't pick up in the break, which um, I have given her some advice prior to this meeting regarding the second resolution, um, and that um, you may wish to lead a conversation or ask a question about that, which I'll, I'm happy to address. But my preference is for us to, 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 to look at the first recommendation and then discuss more detail the second. Yeah, councillors, um, I raised some issues with the Chief Executive who wanted clarification on um, in terms of process and policy for the second parts of the recommendation. Um, it's certainly recommendation two we can deal with, um, in my view, um, and that would not dealing with three immediately would not mean that the project does not run in the interim. So um, I'll leave it there. Would you like to comment further? Yes, so um, thank you, Worship. The uh, paper is drawn in two parts, effectively, as Galen was saying. The first one. Um, uh, is asking for your uh, authorisation for myself <coughs> and the Mayor uh, to sign a contract with LGNZ for the Mayor's Task Force for Jobs. And that's uh, a, a simple uh, consideration for, 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 your, for you. Um, the second part has said we wish to go to James Towers Consultants uh, as the incumbent, uh, and we've listed why in our procurement policy that should occur. Um, I've subsequently spoken with His Worship, who questioned that to me um, outside of Council, uh, and I spoke with the Chief Executive of Ngāwara Ki uh, and I believe, and he believes, Ngāwara Ki Chief Executive, that we would like to discuss this a little bit further as to what's best for uh, our, the, the, um, the delivery of this programme, given that Mayor's Task Force Jobs is located within the premises of Nawara Kinati Ape here in Martin, and that there is contribution from them. Um, and so we'd like to really uh, take a step out to have that hui with Nawara Kinati Ape and to look at who is the best contracting entity with uh, most likely to be James Towers Consultants, and then come back to you for a recommendation later. Uh, the, the issue that I raised was one around procurement, really. Um, and that was looking to set aside some rules um, on the basis that only one person could ever provide this service. And, and please do not take this as any criticism of the incumbents or the way that this has been structured. I just said, to satisfy me, there, need to be some, there needs to be some discussion. But let's deal with the first part first. And if there are any, if, while people are thinking, if there's anything they want to question further with regard to my decision, um, I'll take questions around recommendation two. But I'd prefer that we're speaking to. Yeah, I prefer that we are speaking to a motion uh, reasonably early. Councillor Rokawa, um, do you wish to ask questions or do you wish to put a motion forward? Uh, I'd, I'd like to just 
say is there um, could it be a conflict of interest for me um, being a member of Ngā Wairiki Ngā Te Apu and also knowing the incumbent personally? I mean, we're not related, but does that have any bearing on it? I think you knowing somebody personally um, is not an issue. There's no pecuniary advantage here. I don't, I don't see um, whether you have an iwi or tribal a relationship with Ngā Wairiki Ngā Te Apa, um, you're not employed to, rec to service this agreement in any shape or form? No, no. Con no conflict. Okay, thank you. So then I'd like to move it. Oh, um, would you like it. to say approves or does not approve? Approve. Oh. Thank you. So this is a, looking for a second of Councillor Dalgetty. You second them? Any further questions? Councillor Ash. Sorry, I just want um, some clarification around um, Councillor Rokau is um, moving it. Um, I, I don't have a problem with it per se, but just um, we've had conflicts of, um, you know, like even more ambiguous kind of conflicts where people haven't been able to move or or vote on something. So it just seems to be slightly... Are you challenging um, my determination of conflict? Is that what you're wanting? Yeah, to? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, first of all, from a deal of this in two or three parts is to justify my ruling. The first part is, um, does she know somebody personally? I see... I don't see that as an issue in much the same way that we rule on all sorts of things where we know pe people that are not related to us, that are not of a pecuniary advantage in terms of the decision. Actually, that wasn't my, my position. So the, the second point is I understand that Councillor Rakawa is not employed in this role by the iwi in any shape or form. So I'm not sure I see where the conflict arises. I guess my uh, my query around the conflict was um, with Councillor Rokawa's uh, relationship with the with the iwi itself as opposed to the position itself. Um, I'm just wanting to make sure that we're we're following processes and we don't end up in hot water anywhere if. if We've got that wrong. Yeah, I take on board your concern. Um, the Chief Executive, do, can you advise me? As, yeah, I'm, I'm literally just checking the ruling now. Your Worship, of what happens if an elected member chooses to challenge um, the decision made by Chair on a, on a conflict of interest? If you could leave me a second to... The, the answer is that oh, I believe that the Chair can make a ruling. And, um, I, I just and want to check that. I believe you're right, but I just want to check that. Councillor Belsham. I've just got a question. So this is in regards with recommendation two. That's yes, actually, it's actually not committing to any provider. It's saying that we sign an agreement with LGNZ. Um, so so that I, I don't believe that there, there is any conflict under for that resolution, for that recommendation. Uh, it's about signing an agreement with LGNZ. Uh, to provide, so I can't, it doesn't speak any more than it. happy to accept that. Yeah, more than happy to accept that, Councillor Bushman. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Any speakers to the motion? I'd just like a, um, to make a comment since I know that there is going to be further discussion around um, this project. Uh, at conference last week, um, Central Hawke's Bay won um, an award for their presentation of this programme. And what I thought was outstanding is they actually have a van that takes that takes um, that goes around the district. And in light of the geographical challenges around our district, I thought something like that would work really well in our district. Um, that was just something to think about adding to your discussion perhaps with that. Yeah, mm. it, with regard to the presentation they made, um, I made a series of notes 
at their presentation mm -hmm. around things that I think that we should consider doing, and that was one of them. Awesome. There are some other aspects of how they deliver the program that I thought were equally fantastic. For example, sorry to get off subject here a little bit, but for example, one of the things they do is they convert their library after five o'clock on one night a week, week, I think it is, to a facility where um, those going to doing their apprenticeships, such as electrical apprentices and so on, um, this was at the Mayor's Task Force for Job and wow. the General Meeting, the explanation. And they meet, um, they have coffee together, and they work on the on their paperwork in terms of their qualifications so they feel supported in nature. So there's a whole series of things that they do that I think that we could well look at. Another one that stood out is I think every 16 year old has a driver's license in the district or has the opportunity to. They all have it. Mm. Yeah, not just the opportunity, they've actually achieved 100% mm. of their 16 year olds in, in Central Hawke's Bay now have at least a limited driver's license. Mm. Amazing. So now I've got to remember where the heck I'm at. <laughs> so <laughs> so we've, we've got a motion on the floor. Um, we had a seconder. Um, are we happy if that any other speakers? Otherwise I'll put it to a vote. I don't think there was a right or reply required, but do you Nobody spoke really against it. So I'll put it to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? Motion is carried. Thank you. Um, so, councillors, are you happy that we shelve further process until we've had further discussion? It means rec um, recommendation three as well, Your Worship, yeah. um, but for, from there, no longer. Yeah. So recommendation three, that Council authorise the Mayor and or Chief Executive to sign an agreement with Local Government New Zealand for the delivery of the mahi to Councillor Wilson, Councillor Belsham. This is something that, that flows on from yeah. the first decision. Put it to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? Carried. Thank you. Um, we'll skip on recommendation. Can we, we actually, because it's in the order paper, I need to actually deal with it in some shape or form. Um, could we um, put it in the word? Yeah, line 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 line. Line. Can we let that? Thank you. Can we let that? Somebody move that this lies on the table. Council of Wilson, do and Council of Wilson. Secondly, those in favour? No. Those against? Carried. Thank you. Right. 10.3 the project management, management office report. Would somebody like to please move receipt? Councillor Lambert, Councillor Jalgetti. Um, those in favour? Those against? Carried. Thank you. Thank you, Your uh, Worship. Uh, I think we'll do what we do every month and I'll just step through them and feel free to ask questions as we go along. And I will uh, take, bring your attention to anything that's, uh, that's important, any of them. So the first one is the Mangawika Bridge. Uh, there's just a couple of final things we're finalising to, uh, to complete that project. Um, unfortunately, my husband reports that the new road is actually popping back up on the bridge. So, anyway, so I guess you will that will come through in, in normal. Mm -mm. Is it peeling? I was going to send photos up. Um, yeah, it is. It's making it. There's holes already. I guess we have we have a. Mm -hmm a tidy up process with the contractor there. <coughs> so can we just take that, leave that as an action and start? Well, it, no, because it will need to be a request for service, yeah. Your Worship. Yeah. yeah. I, I can follow that up, please. Thank you. Right, Thank so you. we'll move on. Nothing else from Mangawika Bridge? Uh, Martin de Bulls, wastewater centralisation. We've got quite a bit of information today. We did have quite a bit of information, thank you. Um, one of my questions, well, sorry, the question I've got is around progress 
Now, I know they're doing State Highway 3 currently, um, that's in progress, but the actual linking between the, um, the Wellington Road and State Highway 3, is that, is it, has that been finished or is that still to take place? All finished. Uh, we have got the final walkover of the, country, uh, of the contract next Thursday. What's important to note, though, uh, the pipe bridge across the Tutanui is not in, so that's been excluded out of the contract all along. It'll take a bit longer to design. And then there were two further stream crossings where we, in the contract, said we will drill underneath. Uh, the driller could not get that achieved. It means we would have to have either a pipe bridge or a, attach it to an existing bridge. And again, that design would take too long, so we've removed that out of the contract. So besides for those three links, everything's in, in the ground. Just, just a quick point to make. Uh, Powerco is busy with a big contract at the same time, uh, and there's a lot of crossover between those two, so potentially it could be them or us. Or... Thank you. Are there any pumping stations between... Um, Crofton and the final destination on the, the pipeline journey? There will be only one pump station at the plant, at the market plant. That's the only one. Thank you. Any further questions with regard to this report? No? Let's go along. Thank, Thank you. you. Next one is Lake Waipu improvements at Ratna. <coughs> My question is, in, in our task completed last month on the forecast ones for next month, when we read that with the, the rest of the, of the document, it almost looks a little bit like we're making some stuff up as we go along. I know that's uh, it's probably come out all the wrong way, but you know we've got on-site drilling of monitoring bores, you know, to to um, to monitor stuff and drafting of resource consent application. I mean, isn't this stuff we do before we got this far down the track? So the reply is definitely not. This is part of the process. So we find land. Uh, we're under immense time pressure. So. Now that we have the land, now we need to start preparing the consent for that land that we found. Uh, and that depends on the groundwater situation on the land, it depends on what lands are well for discharge, it depends on all those things. So the, the process only starts once we have the land. It also determines what we have to apply for, for the loading rates, for all the other bits and pieces. And that is the, that is the work that we're busy with right now. It is a lot of work. Supplementary, if I may. So what if we got the wrong middle land? Well, that's sort of what I'm alluding to here. You yeah. know. If, if you remember in the reports that we wrote to Council, yeah. uh, we did a lot of work before we put an mm. offer in for that land to say to the experts, have a look at the land. Do you think this is suitable before we go any further? Which we did, and it was. But for us to be able to submit an application for a consent, we need all this detailed oh, information. Absolute detail, not the... Absolute, mm. absolute. So this is drilling down the rabbit hole stuff, whereas... Yeah. Previously, we were looking at the big landscape picture. <coughs> that's, that's okay, I'm, I'm happy. Should we resume normal practice? <laughs> Sorry, uh, I, I apologise, Your Worship. Well, no, it's good as gold. I'm more than happy to let the conversation think because it is a worthwhile conversation. Go to Councillor Dalgetty and back to myself, Councillor Dalgetty. Um, yeah, my, my questions were along the same lines. I sort of read this and I felt it's costing more is the land actually suitable and the time frames are looking like the, the titan could be pushed out so when do we go or is this is is this the only pathway or is this the right pathway Mr. Chair, uh, this is the only pathway and this is going to happen every time we identify any piece of land we have to identify the land first so we can make the consent fit the land that we found and we would have to do this this all this work for any piece of land that we find it's unavoidable and has to be done uh, our project timeline um, said we would submit the application towards the middle of the year 
So we are maybe a month or so late on that, uh, on what we proposed in the beginning, but it is still running according to what we planned. It is just, it is a lot of information together and package up in the correct way so we can submit a good application and get it through. Um, and budget wise? Yeah, budget wise we're on track. Uh, so all our estimated costs are exactly where we are at the moment. Uh, the unknowns in the budget would be how much the treatment upgrades would cost or how much uh, the pipeline and the pump station towards this land would cost. So we had assumptions in there from 2017 to 2018 and potentially that could be out now. The question from me is we've had the benefit of a naturally occurring event to provide us with effectively statistical information. So what we've had is very significant rainfall out there, which should be able to give us a reasonable scare over the ability of the land <coughs> to accept that amount of water. Are we able to harvest that information in terms of it towards the consent? For instance, we know the amount of rainfall of the catchment, and if we have huge puddles of deep surface water, then at least we have some idea around without the land being reformed, and I know that we can't. Um, is, is that a possibility or has that been considered? Absolutely, yes, absolutely. We are in a fortunate position in that sense that we can have a look at that land where it's really saturated. So that's included in all the work that we are doing. Yep. Lovely, thank you very much. Any, nothing else from me, any other questions for councillors? Right. Great. Push on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the Bulls bus land in Town Square. I think the last outstanding action there is just the installation of the artworks. Questions? Yeah. In August, yeah. No? Push on. Thai Happy Amenities Building. Yeah. Questions? Questions? There we go. Councillor Delgate. I'd just like to congratulate <coughs> staff on, on the external funding they've been successful in getting. Yes, mm. thank so you. That's awesome. Yeah. There are right there. Thank you very much, that's awesome. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Through you, Your Worship, we performed, or Crystal performed really well with us. We got the third highest uh, funding allocation of the whole district, mm -hmm. so she did really well. Six, Thai Happy Grandstand. Yes. Oh, actually, I was just waiting for my chance, if I may, you wish. I just noticed the um, submitting a revised program to end of July due to flu, COVID and weather and all the other things. Um, have, <coughs> has that program indicated, you know, is it, is it fairly tight in terms of expectation of ongoing finish time or...? Three minutes, Mr. Yeah, definitely. So for us, uh, the supply chain is a challenge as you can imagine at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's constant pressure on that su supply chain. Uh, and the same goes for staff availability and, and, uh, and absenteeism. So I think for anything in the construction industry at the moment, those both are challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, if we do see there's something that comes up that'll cause a long delay, we will definitely bring that to council and, and, and bring it to your attention without doubt. Um, so at the moment, it is, it's challenging, uh, but it is, so far, what we've proposed. The target end date is what? I think it's early next year, January or February, something like that. But really, we want to absolutely have it locked and loaded mm. pre rugby season, don't oh, we? Oh, yeah, and definitely. Hopefully, pre the horse events in February. And they've gone good. Mm, yeah. yeah. Um, so, and the opening was the request was to pair it up with. Cambridge Day, was it? That's right, I don't know, from memory, that's late January, I think it is. Mm -hmm. Some, oh, last weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Supplementary, if I may, Your Worship. Um, are we capturing the learnings from this process in terms of time versus um, the cost of materials versus the time cost of labour? Um, the floor that went down was manufactured <coughs> off-site out of um, cross-laminated timber. And when it arrived on site, the 
construction company couldn't believe how quickly they did that job. They normally allowed one to two weeks to do a flooring system. They did it one and a half days, and they thought, what are you going to do with the rest of the week? And I've watched this process. The frame, we're, we're doing the, the roof and the walls by conventional stick frame, where guys cut <coughs> long bits of timber and turn them into short bits and then nail it all together again. And I'm just wondering, are we doing any sort of analysis for the future in terms of off-site manufacture of componentry versus doing stuff on site in the rain in winter? Because that's a comment that's come back to me from some of the guys that work there. Gosh, who'd want to build it? Who'd want to build it? A building in Tai Happy in the winter? Question mark. Because it's rained on them for three months. I guess the answer may be. Uh, it's very be. operational and very process driven, but you know we could possibly make considerable savings by doing things differently. Even if the cost of the component was more, we might save on the labour and the and all the time involved. But is that our consideration, or is it a consideration of the company that's putting in the tender? So if you get a smart company that says, hey, we can do it differently, that should be reflected in the price that's put in and by a tender. We designed it. We paid an architect to do it, didn't we? Not the company. Thank Sorry. You. I think what we strive to do is find that balance mm -hmm. between uh, not stifling innovation, but not letting uh, designers run away with it. Um, and uh, and I think we've done that pretty well. I think, Your Worship, you said that succinctly in, in that we, uh, we, we put innovation uh, in the hands of our supply chain and, and, and encourage through a, through a competitive process to say what, who's, who's the most innovative. And if one, can I, yeah, I'll leave it there. Would you? No. Yeah. Thank you. Are you happy we've moved on? Yeah. So, next one. Thank you. Uh, the next one would be the grandstand. Councillor Duncan, where are you? <laughs> no questions. Uh, no, I just want to say that I'm I'm very delighted that those reports are in, and I'm looking forward to September. I would I I don't know that the Heritage Group has been told that those reports that were coming to them in August are now coming in September. Perhaps um, perhaps that communication, and that would be my only query: Have they been communicated with? Okay, thank you. Um, you worship, if, if I think Anna could, could add something to that conversation, if yeah. that's okay. Yeah, sure. Thank you, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, we received a question earlier in the week uh, regarding the business case for Thai Happy, uh, the Thai Happy uh, Town Hall and, and Council Building, um, together with the Martin Civic Centre. Uh, and first of all, thank you very much for the for the question. It really helps us a lot uh, when we receive them early because we can bring valuable information to the table and it makes everything work a bit better. Um, so as far as those business cases are concerned, the, the consultant that we're using are just finalizing them. Uh, the last portions of it is the cost comparison of potential options and then they put that all together and then they'll bring, uh, the, the consultant will bring a finalized better business case back to council uh, and we are doing that in September. Um, that is the plan. So it's just finalizing the last bits and then we'll bring them both back and we'll do that at the same time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Moving on to item seven, the Martin Industrial Park and Rail <coughs> Hub. Um, as part of this report, I'd quite like just the, the latest update to be given to councillors around where we sit with the environment court process. Uh, Peter, could you update us? Um, yes, I can, Your Worship. The environment court um, has been set down to hear um, this uh, in, on, in September, September 12. Um, as part of that, there's a process called expert conferencing um, on a number of topics relating to the hearing. Um, that conferencing is still going on. However, on Monday this week, the judge issued a minute to us which uh, directed us to mediation. Uh, mediation will be undertaken on August the 15th. And the reason why the judge has directed us to mediation is that fundamentally the experts in the conferencing from both parties are fundamentally agreed on most issues. And so um, I'll take this as a, a, a non-legal position, if I may, Your Worship. It, it generally indicates that the commissioner who 
is sitting within those expert conferences has determined that there's sufficient agreement between the parties that would not clog up uh, an environment court hearing and that there's confidence that the parties can come to a, um, a mediated outcome quickly. There's such a follow-up question from me. <coughs> We've been through mediation once and no matter what we presented, um, it wasn't satisfied. Um, is there any risk that we lose the court sitting date of the 12th of September as part of that process? Yes, I've been mindful of that and have discussed that with my legal uh, council's legal team to, to make sure that the that date is not lost and that we don't want to be forced into making a mediated outcome uh, at the risk of the success of the project. And the last question from me in terms of that process. So if you go into mediation, and it, essentially the matter is resolved within mediation, does that then limit the opportunity for costs to be awarded? I don't know the answer to that question, I'm sorry. Okay. Do you know, Katrina? It's up to the judge. Okay. <coughs> Councillor Lambert. Oh, you actually asked a lot of my questions, but how long would the actual court case take, do you know? Um, usually, I think three days are usually set down for that sort of thing. Okay. Um, but bear in mind then that the judge has several opportunities. One of them is not to deliver, a, uh, has 20 working days to deliver uh, a decision, but also the opportunity is there for the judge to request further information mm -hmm. or effectively put the thing on hold until there have been answers to questions raised. So. Yeah, it, you, you would, if it went to the 12th of September, for instance, you'd be unlikely to see a result on the 13th of September sort of thing. Councillor Gordon. Worship. Um, I've got a question around the mediation. When, when two parties go into that environment, they are they restricted to taking the questions and the the differences that they have prior to the process, uh, prior to that mediation um, date being set down. So what I'm getting at is, do they go into the room and if they get what they want or don't get what they want, do they have the opportunity to then pluck other stuff out of their field or are the rules set and the agenda items set? You know, because my worry is that mediation could just be another ploy and we could get played. So how does this work? Because I'm very much a novice in this space. Um, oh, may I, you wish it? Mm. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm no expert, and um, so I'm providing my interpretation uh, only. Uh, and that is that the expert conferencing has been, been, been between the experts nominated by council and other parties. And so it is those experts who, have, who are providing their independent view on the provisions of the district plan change. And so, for example, a provision might be certain landscaping or hours of operation or traffic management. Uh, and so for each of those, there's been provisions that have been agreed between the parties. And what? And, and so um, if, if now we go into mediation and one party decides to change their expert view, then, then that, that would, I'm not quite sure how that works, but I believe that's not allowed because you've already had that view within expert conferencing. I believe. Yeah, uh, you've been directed by the judge to provide the information. Okay. However, that doesn't still doesn't limit the ability for a party to say, sorry, no matter what's been put in front of me, I'm not going to agree to it. Yeah. Okay. Right, further questions, um, I'm actually involved in a bit of this on a personal level, so um, there is a set timeline they have to resolve this by, isn't there? You mean the environment? Yeah. <coughs> they do have a time limit. Correct. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. But it, however, as I said, the environment court timeline in which you are required to provide an answer, but that answer can also, the process can be stopped. Mm. Um, if the judge asks for information that is not to been provided to their mm. satisfaction. 
and the Environment Court decision could also be appealed on point of law. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm, I shouldn't be, I'm not the expert in this field, but that's, uh, I've had personal dealings through the Environment Court myself. Councillor Belsham. Uh, just looking at the report and one of the read indicator, or the read indicator is around cost estimates exceeding um, exceeding the current budget. And I don't know how much can be answered in this space, but um, the statement is the project team are looking at funding and investment options. How is that progressing? Or is that on hold because of the until the environment court outcome? Um, I'm not sure how much of that we what we can say and can't say there, so I will defer to you. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Um, <laughs> Sorry, but I, I just <laughs> the, 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 report, the report sits in a public arena yeah, and there's a red right. arrow on it, and it mm -hmm. needs some some degree of answer. So what I, we I, do I know is that. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, what, what, what we are aware of uh, is that the cost of the rail part is going to be greater than the funding that's been given to council by the infrastructure reference group. Um, as part of the um, council's annual plan, we resolved, council resolved the potential to set up a special purpose vehicle. One of the um, at and, and, a, and a CCO effectively for council to be part of that special purpose vehicle is what council resolved. Um, and um, <coughs> that would allow other external funders to also be parties to a special purpose vehicle. Uh, there has been considerable discussion with other parties about their contribution to it, but council's contribution is limited to that that were previously declared, um, uh, which I, I think is 9.8, which includes 9.1 of central government plus 800,000 of council, and so it doesn't extend, um, the additional funding won't increase council's contribution. Yeah. Yeah. That's your question. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dalgetty. Uh, is the, um, should we end up in environment court? Is that a public forum or not? Um, Restricted in terms of giving evidence or being allowed to watch the process. Yes, being allowed to watch the process. Um, I think you're allowed to watch the process. Okay. It's a it's an open court, it's a court. in effect. Oh, thank you. Um, but you can't hmm. unless you're a named party within the process. You can't contribute to. For sure. Thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. So we'll move on to uh, number eight, which is the Martin Water Strategy. <clears throat> and the only thing to take note of there is uh, there is a there is a report coming to you on the public excluded today. That's good progress. Any other questions regarding that? Uh, the Regional Treatment Plan Consenting Program. Any questions on that? It's item nine. Mm -hmm. So I'll continue. At the back end of that, we've got miscellaneous items worth noting. There we go. We've got some questions. Um, um, question. Yeah. Oh, let the chair of assets go first. Um, one question, thank you for the miscellaneous. And I note that there's a couple of extra things dropped in there which um, have possibly been. Um, off the radar a little bit, not to say that they weren't progressing in the background. So thank you for getting those on there because it allows the um, uh, you know councillors just to be aware that they are things are not now significant lists, but they are still actions that are being undertaken in behind. So thank you for that. Just looking through all of these reports, and it's occurred to me in the last item in number nine, there is a very very good line, and and I wonder if it's something that we couldn't. In include in all of our reporting thinking, and that is the risk to at scope creep. And if we consider scope creep in all of these other reports, we have a variation on forecasts, costs as being a reporting line, but scope creep and a variation to the contract, I think is significant. And I think we should consider that 
as a reporting line within these reports that councillors can keep a focus on because a variation to contract comes at a cost. And, and I think if we focus on these things that crop up as every day, a small variation can lead to a big variation that can lead to some significant issues. So I just wonder if it's something that maybe, um, Mr. Benedy, through your team and reporting back to us as a, as a governance committee, we could have almost that in there. I know it's, it could sit within the risk, but the variations that I think do crop up and that scope creep is a great word. So. Can I just ask if you see a difference between the scope <coughs> movement, creep, yeah. and um, contingencies within the contract? Well, yeah, I do. I do see 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 a see a difference because I mean a contingency is a con are you talking about a financial contingency, you wish it? Well that's usually yeah, that is that is that is one okay. thing. But a financial contingency which may run at ten or fifteen percent of the total cost of the contract could vary quite dramatically more than that if we haven't identified that there's a scope creep outside what the original variation is. If we're looking at these reports, we see a variation in the forecast spend and we note that we've got that thirty five percent variation zero in the budget but is the budget is the project staying absolutely within the scope of what it is or has it crept um, perhaps i can give you an example i don't I, you wish but i don't need an answer now i'm just no, thinking it's a focus just to clear up the illustration of our things in your mind so if you take the mango with the bridge and there is a contract to build the bridge and then you find that you've got to have relocation of the power um, and sites that you haven't previously thought of at the park, that would be scope creep in your mind? Yes, I would think that that probably would be, and I think that that should be identified in the report as a separate item. So, you know, and, and I think it's that the, the, the council, excuse me for buddy carrying on, sorry. Um, but I just think we as a council should be aware of these things that they come up because they can end up being significant items. And we we have a we have an item coming up later in the in the uh, agenda, your worship, which I think could have picked up some scope creep. Okay. Thank you. Any comment before we move on? Thank you, your worship. Yes, I do. I, I think it's really important that we don't get lines blurred a little bit. Uh, when there's a, a contract and we manage a contract and variations come up, there are certain things we have to do at certain time frames. And we have to move on with things. I think the main thing is exactly what you said, Your Worship. There, there is a budget approved by council to say this is how much the contract is for this, and this is the contingency included in that. And then it really is up to us to manage it within those boundaries. However we want to do it, as long as it comes in, in those boundaries, uh, that really is where it lies. And for me, that's reflected in the, in the project budget numbers. So if something would happen, there is a variation that was unforeseen, and it's going to take us over those budget numbers, absolutely we'll have to come and notify you uh, and potentially ask to extend the budgets or whatever we need to do in relation to that. But I am nervous that if we add something like that, it's going to be after the fact anyway, the variation would have been approved. There's nothing we can do to stop it. Uh, there's tight time frames on those. And I struggle to see what value we would add by going into that kind of level of detail. We have to agree to disagree. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and perhaps that can be part of an asset yes, yes. discussion, rather than spending a lot more time on it now. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any further? For just one from me, in terms of the Papakai pump upgrade, has there is there ongoing discussion at locations um, with the whole Papakai Park group, so they know what's going on? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Yes, uh, we have sent them the proposed plans, what they will look like above ground, so they have an absolute idea of the size of what it is. Anything further? Councillor Dalgetty. Well, I'm just interested um, around the Marae water assessments. Um, so, uh, can you just give me a bit more information as to what's happening there and where actually that available funding is coming from? Yes, government funding. Correct. Sorry. That's correct. Thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, that's, that, that formed part of the money we received from the uh, from the DIA for the three waters. Uh, there was money included there for this project. We spent some of the money on doing the work with WSP where they visited every Marae <coughs> and came up with a list of proposed improvements for every Marae. And what we're doing now is the remainder of those funding 
the Marae will go out get a quote from a plumber or whoever wants to do the work, and then they'll come back and we will fund some of that. That funding was specific to that end point. So, so we're working with the uh, the balance of those Marae to and tell them to take up that opportunity yes. or encourage them to take up that opportunity. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Right, thank you. Councillor Gordon and then Councillor Carter, Councillor Gordon. So these water assessments were for all three waters assets that they have on their site, drinking, sewerage, stormwater. Yep, uh, interesting, stormwater is just the down yep. pipe really, is yeah, yeah. Is. but the drinking water side is what they really looked at. Uh, and if there was obvious wastewater issues that need to be dealt with, they would have brought that up too. But it was really the focus was really drinking water. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Carter, um, the dry riser in, in Bulls, um, the dry main, sorry, it was a main. Yeah. Um, the hole's been dug, it's been filled, so I'm hoping the pipeline's all in there is complete. Through you, correct. That, that pipeline's in, done, completed. Uh, the only bit that's left over is a bit of sealing that needs to be done towards the reservoir. Yep. Thank you. Anything else? Well, I'll go back to recommendation two and I'll ask staff whether we still need a pug team. <coughs> whether that... I, I agree. It feels to me like we have nominated positions yeah. to be represented on that. I just cannot remember the forum that we did that in. And if it was um, by resolution or yeah, I think it was a resolution. Yeah. So what I'll do is ask directly. There were some names yeah. mentioned, Your Worship. Mm. Yep. Yeah. 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 And that's no, something no, I that I referred to. Like so um, listen, what I'd like uh, staff to go through, just check the resolutions mm. and and put an email out to councillors um, in terms of making sure that we know exactly what it is. In the workshop, I believe. I think it was more than that. Yeah. It was either assets or council. Mm. Yeah. No, I'm thinking it was yes. council. Mm. Yeah. We'll do that. Right. That brings us through to item 11 reports for information. Uh, this report updates councils on the remedi remediation of the Potterino block. Pass to the Chief Executive. Um, thank you, Your Worship. And before I, I hand over to Arno from any matters I may miss, um, this is a report that uh, outlines the issues that have faced my team uh, in remediating the, the landfill on Putterino Road. Uh, yes, former landfill on Putterino Road. Um, Council have previously resolved. Um, for funding, which is greater than anticipated, uh, and this um, the report outlines some of the issues that were encountered, uh, how they were resolved, but also notes that this, in my conclusions, um, that this is a a, a particular worrying uh, trend that we do have, or potential trend, I should say, that we do have other. Um, unremediated landfill sites in our district that are, have proximity to Awa. Um, we will recall that this particular issue received high attention from our iwi uh, and um, their uh, uh, encouragement for council to act swiftly to, to prevent um, um, uh, effectively um, there's a litter and etc going into the hour um, and that this you know a bit like climate change uh, this is something that we should be aware of as, as, as a potential risk uh, in the future that council will be required to potentially required to fund do you want to add anything no thank you no, that's good. so first of all let's have somebody move the res receiving of this report Councillor Carter, Councillor Wilson, those in favour? Aye. Those against? Questions of the Chief Executive or team with regard to this report? Councillor Wilson. Well, I accept everything that the, um, uh, the Chief Executive said, and I 100% agree that there, we do have a large risk of these types of events, unfortunately, happening again in our, in our um, district or being uncovered, and I think we're probably not the only council that is, is faced with these problems, but in reading the report, uh, and to be quite blunt, there was some scope creep. 
which is exactly the conversation that I was having before. Within that, there was scope creep and variations in that contract. Hence my previous comment about having a focus on these things throughout these um, these, these, these processes. This is a very unfortunate um, process that we found ourselves in, or situation we found ourselves in, but 100% protecting uh, the river, the Awa, the natural environment was 100% the way to go, and to do it properly and efficiently the first time, not try to hide anything, not kind of shift it somewhere else. We, we approached it exactly the right way, um, but we could have possibly picked up on it a little bit earlier with a little bit more focus on a couple of things. So. It is, it, it is what it is, sadly. But, um, that's the only comment that would make. I, I do think um, that the chief executive has acted properly with regards to making sure that the meridiation of the landfill was done appropriately, um, but also done to make sure it was done safely and that the the, um, the site is now good to be occupied again and we don't face further risks with regards to it, but that's all I'd have to say. Councillor Gordon. Um, I've got a number of questions and really having looked at all of what we've been sent, it's what's not in the report or reports, plural, that I think is um, personally most interesting. I mean, I wonder, you know, I... I've, I've got a whole heap of questions scribbled all over the place, but, you know, was there a landfill remediation plan prepared? Because this is not core business for us. And really, we were stepping into the unknown. We had pressure from litter, you know, bits of plastic wrapped around willow trees, and it was very visual. But it's actually the stuff that we didn't know that we didn't know that was sort of important, which is, you know, heavy metal contamination of, of the soils and all that kind of stuff which led to us making decisions. Um, either we made them actively or they were forced on us when we found, hey, we've got this big pile of stuff and we can't necessarily throw it back in this hole. So, you know, did we have a plan from someone who's competent in this field? You know, I admit that probably there's not a lot of people in New Zealand who are really up on this. Did we have a plan that actually spelt out all the potential risks, what the boundaries might be between sitting it all and throwing it back into the hole to removing everything on site and taking it to Bonny Glen or somewhere else. I, I actually think that we sort of walked into this a bit blind. This, having said that, we actually might have got the best financial outcome. <coughs> you know, we might have just muddled our way along and got to the, the right end point, but, <coughs> but not actually having the plan. Or not having the plan that we thought we should have. And, and really without without having the project plan dumped in a big pile in front of us to sift through, we don't know. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, and please, Peter, correct the bits that I, that I might leave out. For me, we followed a very logical process to get to where we are in the sense that we identified potential ways to remediate based on the work done by WSP at the time. The problem with these landfills is you don't know what you don't know. Exactly. And that's wrapped up in the conditions of the consent. So what they're saying is, that's great, all the work you've done, we've got a really good idea of what's going on there, but as you go along, we expect a whole lot more testing and a whole lot more of a whole lot of things that we have to tick off. And that's really when you uncover what you really have there. So personally, I feel it doesn't really matter where we would find these landfills. We would have to follow the same set of steps okay. to say, let's do, let's do investigations up front to tell us what we have, but you don't know what you don't know. Further question? Yeah, yeah, did, um, we were offered some competency at a WSP. Did we take that up? We did. So what did that personal persons bring to, to the room that we didn't have? I can start off by saying up front in the investigations, uh, expertise and skills that we don't have in-house. Uh, then when we moved on to the contract itself, it was really resource that we don't have. And then obviously being WSP, they bring all the, all the skills and, uh, and expertise with them. Uh, yeah, so our PMO is too small to do all of it. It's not possible. So, another supplementary, if I may. Um, go ahead. Where, you know, where did we 
come unstuck because we ended up taking an awful lot of stuff off site that probably with the right on site management we could have kept there. But the question I have is, you know, in order to keep, especially the contaminated material on site, we might have had to almost encapsulate all that material in a clay seal or something similar akin to Bonnie Glen, and it might have actually been cheaper just to take all Bonnie Glen. You know, was, was that extreme example, was, was that extreme outcome part of our thinking that actually we might have to do a lot more on site to actually wrap this whole site up, make it squeaky clean? I'm um, not getting into detail, but, yeah, I mean, I think we'll, but I mean, this is I the problem. We are getting into detail here. What I would like um, the staff to think about in terms of you know, lessons learned in terms of the interface here with council is whether staff looking back on it are convinced that the reporting structure to council in terms of the arrows and things that go the green and reds and things, whether there was enough factual information within that um, or whether whether we should be given uh, this is the budget for this, this and this section, those sorts of things as to whether they would have raised you know, whether there, essentially whether there are any learnings in terms of, of altering the reporting structure. Um, but I'll pass to the Chief Executive for comment. Um, I, I think there are two things here and Councillor Delgetti asked a good question um, prior to this meeting, which was a rega regarding uh, governance, governance training. Uh, and I know as part of this trimester, some of, the, of our elected members have undergone training with the Institute of Directors to support the inquiry and curiosity around good questions to ask mm -hmm. from a governance sense of, in this, in this um, example of our project management office and our reporting. On the other side, on the operational side, I support what you've said, Your Worship, that um, we need to be crystal clear, and, and Councillor Wilson raised it earlier, around our PMO reporting, and is it fit for purpose for our elected members to make good decisions, and to raise appropriate inquiry? And I have asked Arno, um, <coughs> with his new PMO, that, that uh, well, his expanded PMO as part of our annual plan, to work with our chair of assets to look at how we present reporting to you uh, that facilitates those questions to be asked in a robust way and gives you confidence that we're providing the right level of information. Because the last thing councillors want to be sprung with is a surprise, mm. and that's the bottom line. Or, or the wrong information you wish, mm. I should add, yes. Councillor Belsham and Councillor Lando. I just note in the report, um, back in November 2020, WSP provided the senior project manager with an offer of service to prepare the document with the contractor, but they also stated that um, they would provide an engineer with a contract who would facilitate monthly meetings. Um, so in reading that, I would expect, you know, to, to tell us of, of any surprises, any concerns, mm -hmm. as the, and that was on a monthly basis mm -hmm. with the contractor. So as a governor, I would have expected those to be raised with us on a monthly basis um, at a governance level, yeah. and they weren't. Yeah. Um, so where is that, you know, where's the learning from that, I guess, uh, as to who had to keep their finger on the pulse, you know, to make sure that that information was portrayed back to us. I mean, ultimately it's happened, yeah. um, and it's going to come at a, at a cost to the council, no matter yeah. whether, whether it was identified earlier or not. But you know, if it was around the governance table, we could have had an opportunity to question methods um, to deal with the issue. Um, but I think there's been a real breakdown in, in that aspect. And I don't know whether they fulfilled their obligation in providing that engineer to have those meetings, or whether we haven't, uh, from an operational point of view, followed up and said, are these taking place? Um, yeah, so from a governance perspective, I would have expected that. Uh, that that was enough to give us confidence that if there were any surprises, they would have been raised. Councillor Lambert, yeah, just sort of along those lines. Like whenever I 
chair a meeting like that, I like to ask the person who wrote the report, have you, have you got any concerns? And then have the environment where they're quite happy to say, well, look, I'm not very happy about this, as opposed to trying to get councillors find the mistakes. You know, like we're all one team. And if they can, if you can just ask the person, tell me what you've got concerns about, and then they can answer it. Well, you know, then we're all, you know, you're, you're telling us, you know, they say, we've got a problem here. What do you think the solutions are, you know, like, as opposed to trying to find the mistakes? Um, I think both councillors, Your Worship, have identified uh, or ha have talked about their expectations, and I would add that I, I, I support those, and they are my expectations also, uh, and they are something that I um, have been discussing with Arno of how we ensure those things are indeed in front of you to allow you to make those good decisions. Yes. So I agree entirely with, with your expectation, and uh, our job is to fulfil that. Thank you. So Councillor Dawson yeah. asked a question about the WSP staffer and the monthly meetings. So was that staffer sufficiently reporting to Project Management Office about these issues? If, if I may, to you. I think that the main thing is we can we can really look at the detail of where things broke down. I think ultimately I take responsibility for not bringing that to your attention earlier. Ultimately, there's no way for me to step away from that responsibility as, as being mine. Uh, the lessons learned for the PMO going forwards is substantial out of this and how we can improve on that. Exactly uh, what Councillor Valsham said earlier, if if that was reported to council much earlier, this would be a, a much different conversation. So for us, looking, looking at the future really is where the attention should be now as to how do we prevent that from not happening again. Uh, and that's something I'm working on with the PMO. Thank you. I'll go to Councillor Duncan and then I'm looking to move on. I think we're starting to go back over the same ground here, Councillor. Councillor Duncan. Thank you, um, Your Worship. I totally agree. I just want to thank the CE for this very comprehensive report and say that during this process from the very beginning, I found it um, uh, it all looked very swimming until we found out things started to crumble. And, it, and from, from, from that to from good to not good was quite abrupt um, for me. But all along, I felt that that staff have tried to provide the best reports they can. And um, I'd like to thank them for that. And I can see that we knew we didn't know a lot. And it was a process of going through it. And um, it's been very unfortunate. But I think everyone's been very good at taking responsibility and trying to see the learnings. Thank you. Thank you. I'll move on to 11.2, the annual report for the Alcohol and Regulatory <coughs> Licensing Authority for the year ending I think this is a standard report. Um, would somebody be happy to move that it's just as a receipt? Councillor Gordon moving, second to Councillor Ash. Um, any discussion or put to vote? Those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? Carried. Thank you. Moved to item 12. Could somebody move as a block that the following minutes be received from committees? Councillor Lambert, Councillor Carter, those in favour? That's against, carried. And would somebody like to move, so move that we move into public excluded for the reasons given? Thank you. Councillor Belsham, seconded. Councillor Dalkety, those in favour? Thank you. For those online, thank you very much. It's like Patent Place or something, or Coronation Street. Next session, next time. Thank you very much for screening up.